Hey, we're recording. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the October 10th, 2023 meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, we have a quorum. Um, and I think, in fact, we have a full house of members. We don't have Dan. We don't have Dan. Okay, yeah, gotcha. And and Janet's here. Yeah, okay. Okay, missing. Are we expecting Dan at all? Um, Stephanie, do you know? I didn't hear back. Okay, okay. All right, great. Well, this is a, a good good um, uh, membership turnout. And uh, for the record, at least starting the meeting, we have... Um, six other attendees from the public. So thank you for for those participants joining in to, to um, listen and participate with uh, any public comments at the end of the meeting. All right, so today's an important day for the uh, working group to try to um, finish up uh, for the most part our work uh, through the of the uh, of the drafting the bylaw itself. Uh, Hats off to um, Chris for all her work over the course of the last two weeks and pulling together the draft that we'll be reviewing today or the second half of the draft that we didn't get to yes uh, last time. Um, and for um, other uh, members who have provided some comments to uh, to Chris. Um, so let me call up the agenda. We have a few initial activities to uh, get through first. Wayne, if I could, um, there was a revision to the agenda, uh, which was an item two authorization of a member to approve October 10th, 2023 meeting minutes. So whoever is doing the minutes today, um, it's just a vote to have, I would think you as chair, but just to authorize the committee to authorize you to approve the final minutes. Um, well, it did make it on to the official calendar posting, but I think I accidentally may have sent you all the second revision versus this last revision. So it's the only change. Um, okay. I just wanted to make sure everybody saw that or are at least aware of that. Okay. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, if we, if, if it makes sense to the working group uh, so that we can approve all the minutes. Um, okay. Uh, um, so we'll get to that after we review the meeting, the minutes of the meetings that we do have available uh, as drafts. Um, and so first for the um, now somewhat historic minutes <laughs> of, of um, what's eight, August? Yeah, August uh, 4th, 2023. Um, thank you, Stephanie, I believe for pulling those together. Um, and uh, they were included in our packet. Do we have any comments um, or a motion to approve um, those minutes? <laughs> Janet. Um, I thought they were excellent minutes. Um, you know, they were very long, but they really covered a lot, like what Jonathan Murray said, which was very nuanced um, and important to read again. Um, so I, I'd like to make a motion to approve the, the minutes of August 10th, 2023. I second. Thank you. And um, excuse me, I think it was August 4th. August yeah, August. 4th. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I revised my motion. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll hold the second, I think. Okay. Okay. So right. in no particular order, if you could please unmute. And Laura, I'm sorry, I do need your camera on just for the vote. Uh, McGowan? Um, yes. Brooks? Yes. Breger? Yes. Tanner? Yes. Jemsek? Yep. Tagliarulo? Yes. Thank you. Minutes are approved. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. And um, now we have the minutes from the last meeting uh, which was just a week ago, uh, October 3rd, 2023. Um, do we have any comments on those or a motion to approve those? Okay. Is it possible to display them quickly? Yeah, I'm just looking for them now, sorry. Yeah, they just went out. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yep. 
Free. Yeah, sorry, I was away for the weekend in New York with my girls. So I apologize. Um, if you just give me a second, I'll share the screen. So you should be able to see those. Yep. Oh, you know, I have a few, two sections, I think, where I had questions. I, which I, read. One of, I did correct one of them, Janet. Okay, thanks. Upper. It's just this one question, I think, was the only one that's left in the red. Yeah, I think that was Martha's comment. Yeah, I mean, I think I did say that... Uh, have the uh, permit granting authority approve importing soils because we don't, you know, want just junk stuff imported. Okay. Yeah, but there, when we get to that section of the real draft, there is a question about the keeping soils on site that was brought up by Scott Cashin when we when we get there, but that's not relevant to the minutes. So I'll just strike the comment. Yeah. They're not sure this is right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Stop for a minute. Let us read. Mm -hmm. All right, any other thoughts or comments that people have or need a little bit more time? All right, any final comments on these or anybody want to make a motion to approve these minutes? I move to approve the minutes. Second. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Robert. And and let me thank Janet for um, drafting these minutes too. Welcome. Okay, again, um, please have your cameras on, be unmuted and in no particular order. Brooks? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Demsec? 
Yes. McGowan? Yes. Henner? Yes. Tagliarulo? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. <clears throat> okay, before we leave the topic of uh, minutes uh, and, and, and get to the topic of, of the today's minutes, I need to um, find a minute taker and apologize I didn't get that started. We missed the notes on the uh, on the approvals just now, but we can get those from the official record from Stephanie, whoever's taking the minutes. Um, my records show that it's it's Dan's turn, but he's not here. Um, and the second one up would be uh, would be Martha. I was um, kind of afraid of that, but yeah, yeah uh, okay. I, I assume that 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 um, if it takes a week or so, that that's okay. There's there's no real urgency then. Yeah, that's fine. They just as long as you all now vote to authorize someone to approve the final minutes. Uh, I'm assuming Dwayne as chair would make the most sense, but yeah. Wait, do we do we need a motion for that, Stephanie? We do. Yes. Is there a motion to um, enable the chair um, to approve the minutes of October tenth? This is Bob. Um, I when make available. that motion. All right. Thank you, Robert. Bob. Is there a second for that? I'll second. All right, thanks, Jack. So is it, are we authorizing Dwayne to be the one to approve them? Yes. Okay. So again, in no particular order, um, Breger? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Brooks? Yes. And Paglia Rulo? Yes. Can you just put your camera on real quick and say yes? I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. I think that's the last vote as far as I can tell. <laughs> all right. Okay, great. All right. With that all aside, okay, so Martha, you're starting the minutes now, so thank you. Yes. Um, okay, let me just make a note of that. Okay, returning to the agenda, we have any staff updates, um, Stephanie, and then Chris. I do not have any updates. I do not have any updates. Super. Okay. Um, all right. Any committee updates from the committees that we are liaising from? <laughs> I have none from ECAC. I, I don't have anything from the planning board. Say again, Janet, nothing? Um, nothing from the planning board. Okay, thank you. Oh, I, though we did hear the Shootsbury Road um, presentation, which is relevant, obviously. All right, anybody else? Okay, so the bulk of today will be uh, to continue through the reading and reviewing and editing and commenting on the solar bylaw draft. Again, thanks for, to Chris for pulling this together. Um, we did review what might be about the first half of the draft last time with some comments and edits suggested that Chris, you have now incorporated in the draft that we'll be looking at today, uh, though we won't be going back to that. Um, and uh, we'll continue through the reading of that. Um, so does that sound good with everybody? Awesome. Okay. Um, Stephanie, are you in a position to do this screen share? I am. I just want to ask Chris, I'm looking at the yeah. working copy I just want to know what page I know you you have it's, something it's the October 9th version that I sent out yesterday right and it's um I think page 11 is where we stopped yeah. okay just making sure that I have this 
and just to let people know that who weren't here last time, um, that we didn't review the Nexus statement and we didn't review all the submittals. Um, and that's it, I guess. Uh, also, I wanted to just say that um, I did incorporate all of the changes that we made on October 3rd. Um, but I wasn't able to incorporate the changes that were sent to me over the weekend. We had a long weekend, and I took most of yesterday off, although I was here for a couple of hours, but I just didn't have time to incorporate um, all of the comments. I did receive comments from Janet and from Martha, and I received uh, a comment from Bob Brooks, um, and I think that was it. So I will, you know look at those comments and try to incorporate them after this meeting, but I didn't do it as of today. Um, Chris, I'm going to share my screen, but I might have to do some adjusting in terms of where we start. So you can just direct me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Go ahead, Martha. Yes. Uh, question to Chris. I know that Scott Cashin sent uh, a long list of comments from his perspective. Uh, have you had a chance to look them over and incorporate them, or is that still pending? I looked over the first set of comments that Scott sent, which was a few weeks ago, and I incorporated some of those comments. Um, I have not had a chance to um, incorporate comments sent last week. I mm -hmm. read through them, but I haven't incorporated them. Yeah. Um, it's it, it was just, um, well, I, I don't need to tell you it was a monumental <laughs> task. I mean, yeah, I just could I, I, not I, I, get I, all of those comments. And right. um, so if we want to have another meeting, that's, you know, something for the group to decide. But I was not able to incorporate those, just the comments that um, we managed to put together last uh, Tuesday. Yeah, just just for the group's information, then Scott Cashin is the is the one who's been listening to our meetings and who'd recently moved from California and taken an interest because he's a biologist who's had experience reviewing uh, proposals for solar bylaws. And so his comments were related to, you know, just kind of little specific things to tighten up the bylaw and, you know, prevent exceptions plus some uh, specific biological insights. So it wasn't, you know, major policy or anything, but it was uh, a, a lot of what seemed to me to be helpful, um, specific comments. So that's all. I mean, I'm sorry, I have my hand up, but um, I can't find my raise hand function and it was up. I was trying to get it before Janet raised hers. So Janet, I'm just going to jump in real quick. Sure. Um, I think it would be appropriate, especially at this point, given that the draft is going to be going to staff that the conservation staff review Scott's comments because they're more relevant to their area of expertise. So um, I think that would just be a logical progression, seeing that it's going to all of the department heads at this point. Chris is going to be discussing that at some point, I believe, in terms of next steps. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Janet, go ahead. So I, I was sort of like a process question, which is, so Chris has put in edits from our meeting last week, but not in response to more recent comments. So as we go through this document, you know, I had comments that I should bring them up now again, because it makes sense that, you know, since we're decision making as a group that everybody hear it, um, you know, whatever anyone's comments were. So that that's my process question. And then on the Scott cash in front some of his stuff was you know good comments about our draft and some of it was super detailed and i was thinking about you know he, you know he had like a whole section at the end i mean here we have this sort of, sort of fortunate experience of having a wildlife biologist who has dealt with you know hundreds of solar arrays and then we have the kip kolosankis who is a soil scientist agricultural expert who also deals with solar arrays but a lot of their comments are super like I think Scott described it as granular. And I wondered if we could incorporate, um, you know, their comments, you know, very specific comments as kind of an appendix or an attachment saying, you know, these are too detailed, you know, to put into the bylaw because other, you know, it could be, you know, more pages long, but, you know, these are good guidance for any, you know, board looking at an array so that it's sort of an education for them 
and also in education, I think sometimes the people citing solar arrays may not be experts about compacting agricultural soils and how to avoid it or how to provide, you know, 24 inches of something. And so that was just an idea. I thought to, you know, use that expertise um, in a way that would be useful for other people that, you know, aren't educated on that. So I think we could talk about that later, but I just, it just occurred to me like an hour ago. So, but I, I do wonder, do you want to hear people's comments that they made already? So the whole group can kind of listen to them and make decisions on it. <clears throat> Are you referring to comments in what the drafting that we've already done, the, the first half of the bylaw? Um, I mean, the you know, the comments that Chris received this week, but wasn't able to get to. Well, why don't we hear them as we get to those sections? Okay. Of, of the of the of the language. Yep. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say uh, I will. I think I wanted to like go through and give Chris detailed comments, and I just my my week the last week has just been kind of crazy. Uh, but I'll go ahead. You know, if I can, it sounds like Chris. There's still opportunity for you know detailed. Edits that you can that that'll get filtered somehow in some other review past you know the the charge of our group. Um, so anyway, I that's all. But you know, I feel like you know the the detail that we're looking at. You know, we're not going to get this perfect right now. I feel I, like we're in danger of making this more of a like a policy type document versus just the bylaw, which is what it's supposed to be. I mean all the things that we're talking about are uh, to have all of them spelled out just seems uh you know <laughs> they may come into play they may not but uh i just i i just feel like it's getting way too cumbersome uh as it is and so much of it is i don't think relevant i mean compaction of soils on agricultural land when you have tractors that are heavier than any sort of equipment that would be coming in and I, I mean it's just it, it kind of drives me crazy obviously but uh, that's just my uh, my opinion but Chris is that is that okay if I send you something or would it would it not be used no you can send it to me we're going to be going through other reviews after this group is finished with its work thank you yeah thank you for that and I, I would also provide that at least in like for the agriculture if we're talking about the uh, dual use arrays or agrivoltaics, the state has prescribed regulations with regard to issues around soil compaction and how to try to mitigate that. Um, and I, I guess my sense would be not to uh, set up two different rules uh, that developers would and farmers and landowners would need to abide by, but um, um, uh, be recognize that the state has has rules um, already on the books that need to be uh, um, uh, met uh, by the developers. Okay, uh, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment in response to what Janet said. I think um, a zoning bylaw, you know, can't really have appendices that are documents prepared by someone else. Um, we can certainly make those documents available to people who are interested in, um, you know, having large scale solar arrays or battery storage or whatever, but I don't think it would be appropriate to put those into the zoning bylaw because what goes into the zoning bylaw becomes the town law and, um, you know, and it has to be adopted by town council and review reviewed by KP law. And so it's really not, an opportunity to have the type of, you know, comments that are in Scott Cashin or Kip's um, documents. As I said, I will go through Scott Cashin's and try to incorporate the things that seem to be relevant from him. But um, I think we've included a lot of what Kip said, not the fine detail, but uh, again, this document right now is 25 pages long. Most cities and towns have much smaller, shorter um, solar bylaws. And I think, you know, we're kind of um, running the risk of going overboard with this. So anyway, that's all I have to say about that. Thanks. All right. Let's try to put this 
um, issue aside and then move on to the, the um, review that we have. But Janet, one last comment. Well, you know, actually, I was I think I was unclear because I was thinking exactly the same thing. We don't want to put that level of detail into the bylaw, but I think capturing maybe their comments and, you know, somehow presenting it to a board later saying here is some expert advice on stuff. So I, I, I'll, I'll think it through more. I don't want to add that to the bylaw because I do think it's, you know, way too deep or detailed. All right, great. So let's carry on when Chris is, is ready um, with the language. I thought what we do, we, we do have a three hour meeting today. We'll try to take a break after an hour and a half to two hours, find a place, find a time, uh, like five minutes, um, <clears throat> and then we'll resume um, um, to break it up a little bit. But um, Chris, whenever you're ready. Okay. Anyway, I yeah, okay. I think we got through um, the visual impact and um, I had made a comment about um, the wireless telecommunication devices uh, in our zoning bylaw having something about visual impact. Those are really just line of sight requirements. Um, people who are putting up monopoles uh, need to provide line of sight uh, details to the board, but they don't have to um, there's not really a section on visual impact. So I don't know if Mar um, Janet had a chance to look at that, but I just wanted to correct my statement from last time. Um, I think we got through the visual impact and we were about to start on fencing, if I'm not mistaken. So why don't we start there? Um, and, and I have a question for Laura here, um, which yeah. relates to this section. Uh, so anyway, I'll start reading. Um, there shall be a fence built surrounding the solar array and ancillary equipment. The fence shall be knuckled selvage chain link fence unless determined otherwise by the PGA. The bottom of the fence shall be at, le at least six to eight inches above the ground to allow wildlife crossing under the fence. Fencing shall not include barbed wire. It is acknowledged that appropriate measures shall be taken to prevent the solar arrays from being damaged or tampered with by individuals trying to access the area of the installation. The method of securing the site shall be subject to the approval of the permit granting authority. Um, I think some of this business in um, this yellow down below might be left out. The first sentence, for instance, the need for fencing shall be determined by the applicant unless such fencing is needed to comply with town bylaws or as required per federal or state regulations. I think we're already saying uh, in the first sentence that there shall be a fence. And so then allowing it to be um, a decision made by the applicant, I don't think that makes sense. So I would cross out that first sentence unless Laura has uh, a different point of view. Um, which, um, which sentence are you proposing uh, crossing out? Um, the first sentence in the yellow uh, highlight, the need for fencing shall be determined yeah. by the applicant. I don't think that makes sense to you. Um, the only, um, so depending upon who is financing the project, um, they might have different requirements. But I think this is just pretty pretty general. You know, I mean, if someone, you know, is selling a project to Nexamp, for example, or Nextera, and they have uh, particular requirements um, regarding fencing, uh, you know, obviously it, it will be taken into consideration. Um, maybe we just include some you know, some consideration of if, um, you know, like essentially if different fencing requirements are necessary, you know, from the applicant, we'll consider, um, you know, we'll, we'll consider uh, making those modifications and then like that. So modifications could be approved by the PGA? Yes, exactly. I think that, thank you, Chris. My uh, words are eluding me at the moment. So appreciate um, I'm noticing that this doesn't seem to be the latest copy of this document. Um, I sent one out yesterday that was dated October 9th, and this copy here doesn't seem to include some of the, um, what do you call them, uh, track changes? Chris, this, so, so uh, this does say October 9th at the top. Um, so do you want to resend it to me and I'll open the one that the latest one there oh, were several versions and I was trying to keep track so 
Yes. Um, so I. Hmm. Um, let me see. I'm, unless I'm reading it wrong, but sorry for that. I wonder. I uh, wonder if the track changes disappeared when I emailed it to you. Well, it gets saved as well. It gets saved as a PDF because this is from the meeting packet. So when it gets saved, sometimes I, I've noticed that sometimes. It, oh, okay. So why don't I email you the latest just, version? Okay, hold on. I'm just sorry for the. Yeah. So because when it system. when it gets saved as a PDF, then you can't um, you can't incorporate <laughs> those track changes because those are things that are kind of movable. Okay. All right, I get it. So let me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing because I don't want to make everyone nauseous. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. And while you're doing that, we'll hear from Mar uh, Janet. You're muted. Yep, you're muted. Of course, I'm muted. So Martha and I <clears throat> did a site visit at the solar, the dual use farm in Hadley with Jake Marley. And we want, and so we, I don't know if we can update, but one of the questions we asked Jake, cause he, the, the array, the, the panels were, there was no fence around them. And Martha asked that question, do you need fencing? And he said, and what, you know, my question was, what's the purpose of the fencing? And he said, their panels were 10 feet high cause it's a uh, dual use. And he said, basically, the fencing is to keep people out from electrocuting themselves. And since they're so high, you know, unless you really go up and try to kill yourself, it's not easy to do. And so they don't need fencing. He also thought the panels could be at eight feet and still be successful. So it does seem like there are circumstances where people just don't want fencing and they don't need it. So I, I think the the, the, origin, the the beginning language works well because it allows people to say, no, we don't need fencing because it's so high. Okay. All right, so you would leave that first sentence of yeah. the yellowed area in. Okay. Well, maybe All maybe right. it should be the uh, first sentence of the whole section that's uh, instead of saying fencing shall be required, it should say section um, fencing shall be required unless approved otherwise by the by the PGA. I think it does say that, but I may be wrong since I'm not sure what we were looking at. Yeah. Yeah, but I I thought that flexibility was good. Yeah. Was the, the 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 question that. I mean, the phrasing that Chris used in response to Laura saying something about modified, I didn't write it down. That sounded good at the five yep. minutes ago. Yeah, okay, we'll get back to that when we see the language. <laughs> Laura? Yeah, I don't want to belabor this. I think um, as long as, you know, there's, there, um, I'd be very curious to know the insurance requirements. And as long as Amherst is not on the hook for anything, if we don't have fencing, and someone says we don't need it, because there, you know, it is an electrical generation system. It's a basically like a mini power plant. Um, so as long as, you know, I just want to make sure we're covered, we're covered there. If we ever approve no fencing, that's all. Yeah, I'm wondering if the um, agrivoltaic projects generally don't have fencing because you need to get equipment in, in there. Yeah, I mean, 10 feet is is obviously exceptional, yeah. I see. Okay, so I should reword this to accommodate what we just talked about. All right. So, Chris, um, I'm not, it's not coming in because I'm having to remotely access my email. Um, and I don't have it yet, but, and I just went back to the one that was sent to the group. Um, and when I opened it, it does not show the track changes. Um, so, I'm not sure how quickly I can get this up. I'm sorry, this is taking a while. When I open the one that I sent yesterday to everybody, it shows track changes to me. Oh. So I wonder if Dwayne can share. Let me, I'm going to look again. Is this the one that says um, working copy two? It doesn't or say working copy two. It just says working copy and it's dated... The email that I sent, um, the document is day is called Draft Solar Bylaw 10923 Working Copy. And I sent it yesterday at 3.29 p.m. I'm, I'm opening it up. Let me see if it's just. Oh, yeah. I have. Uh... Yeah, I don't yeah. know why. It's not showing track changes on my version for whatever reason. Okay. Mine seems to have it. So I can, um, let me just get down the fencing section to see if. In fact, there's track changes here. Uh, yes, there there are. You want me to share my screen then? Yes, please. 
<clears throat> oh, sorry about that, Chris. I'm not sure why it's not showing up on mine. There we go. Yep. Okay. So um, I'm going to reword this to accommodate the idea that um, most of the time we want fencing, but there may be times that the PGA could approve a situation without a fence. All right. So we don't have to go through all the particular wording of that. Um, so screening and planting. The LGPI shall be designed to minimize its visibility, including preserving natural vegetation to the maximum extent possible, adding vegetative buffers and or fencing to provide an effective visual barrier from adjacent roads and driveways and from abutting dwellings. The installation shall be screened year-round from public and private ways and from adjacent residential lots to the extent, extent that is feasible. The PGA may alter or waive this requirement if such screening would have a significant detrimental impact on the design, operation, and or performance of the array. The PGA may consider the provision of screening and buffers when re reviewing a proposed L LGPI to protect scenic vistas and view sheds and to protect views from residential uses, public streets, and any waterways or water bodies. Where existing vegetation in the setbacks is insufficient to achieve year-round screening, additional screening shall be provided, including but not limited to planting of dense vegetative screening, fencing, berms, use of natural ground elevations and or land contouring, all depending on site-specific conditions. Tree cutting within the required setback area shall not be permitted if it would reduce to any degree the effectiveness of the year-round screening. However, if there are trees within the screening area that cast shade on the solar panels, they may be removed. I think the point of that is some trees grow taller than others, and if some were to grow tall enough to cast shadow on the, on the panels, that would be a problem for the array. Um, I think there was a question about that last time. Actually, it looks like we've um, reviewed these things already. So anyway, I'll just keep going. Planting shall include a variety of native trees and shrubs of varying heights staggered to effectively screen the installation from view during construction and operations. The depth of the vegetative screen shall be a minimum of 30 feet unless otherwise approved by the PGA. At least 75% of the planting shall consist of evergreens and shall be evenly spaced throughout the setback area. Additional plantings should include native plants that provide pollen, food, pollen, and or shelter for native wildlife and or follow a food forest model. Integrating trees, shrubs, perennial plants, and ground covers to mimic a native woodland that creates habitat for local wildlife and provides food for humans and wildlife. Use of invasive plants as identified by the most recent version of the Massachusetts Prohibited Plant List maintained by the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources is prohibited. Cultivars of native plants may be acceptable if sourcing of native species is not possible. Applicants shall install plantings within the array, including native species and pollinator-friendly species, and species that are supportive of wildlife, rather than installing non-vegetative materials, such as stone mulch, unless otherwise permitted by the PGA or unless the project is operated as an agrivoltaics project, in which case the plant materials shall be appropriate to the agricultural purposes. Planting of the vegetative screening shall be completed prior to the connection of the installation. Plants shall be maintained and replaced, if unhealthy, by the owner-operator of the installation for the life of the installation. Okay, are there, are there any uh, changes or comments there? Wayne, I'm going to knock you off because I just found, uh, okay. I just figured out the problem. So perfect. Yep. Okay. And uh, Martha, and then I have a comment or a question as well. Yep. Janet, go ahead. Oh, I, th you... I think, okay. I think there's a contradiction between saying that you have to have the plantings in before during during before construction or um operation and then later on it says um the plantings have to be in before the project goes online. So I can you point to where those two things are? 
I could have. <laughs> Give me a, a paragraph. Uh, the, what does the paragraph start with? Um, I, 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 I'm not. I don't have a draft. Let me find the old oh. draft. Okay, yeah, I'll re, I'll re share. Are you, and then, are you uh, sorry? Are you see, seeing my screen or not? No, we're seeing a, a, a menu to enter a password with a nice flower in the background. Okay. I think I can find it if I. I'm looking at an old, old draft. I just, I just reading it again. Right. That... Here you go, Janet. Yep. Okay. So it says, um, let's see. It was part of this one. Can you go up a little bit more like to the top? Um, oh, I was, oh, it's the planting shall include a variety of native trees shrub, and shrubs of varying lengths a little bit lower, staggered to effectively screen the installation from view. It's the one that with, with the 30 foot, the paragraph with the 30 foot buffer. So they say, screen the installation from view during construction and operations. And then the last paragraph says, the planting of the vegetative screening shall be completed prior to the connection of the installation. So I think, I think construction would be a bad time to put the, I mean, Everybody should be feel free to put in screening, but I think construction might be a bad time. I would defer to Laura. So we should cross out the word construction. I get it. Yep. I agree. Yeah, right. yeah. During yeah. operations. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Just give me a second because I do have it. I just want to relieve Duane of having to deal with this. So just give me one okay. second because it is yeah, on the screen. Bump me off when you're ready. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> and I guess I wanted to ask, um, you know, maybe Laura for her sense on this um in terms of the last paragraph also um where the planting should be completed the screening shall the screening shall be completed prior to connection of the installation the connection of the installation i, I i'm not sure if we would what we mean by the screening i guess it's the planting of the screening shall i mean be don't 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 we also um I think so for example if you are it's very typical in the solar world to drive everything to get it interconnected to the, the you know to the utility by the end of the calendar year which is also a terrible time to plant anything new as far as like you know vegetation so I think um we just need to be mindful of like timing that just doesn't work out as far as planting goes. Cause on one hand, you know, typically there's a delay. I think we need to like include language, you know, planting should occur after the construction is complete and prior to interconnection. Um, and then something to the effect of like exceptions will be granted if, you know, basically you're trying to plant something in November, you know what I mean, or, or something like that. But um, typically there's a delay between when construction ha is complete, it's called mechanical completion before the project is reaches commercial operation. Um, but, you know, I just, I, I think that we're, what the spirit of this is we're not trying to get people to plant things when it's freezing out, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe they just need to plant, provide a, a you know plan. I'm assuming that'll go to the planning board of when they're going to um, plant the required buffer zone. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was concerned about. I mean, the the, the interconnection is critical, and you don't want to um, delay that on your end if the utility is ready for it uh, because you haven't completed the planting yet. Okay, I can work out uh, some wording for that. In other words, provide a plan to the permit granting authority describing um, the planting sequencing. Exceptions will be granted by the permit granting authority in case of seasonal whatever difficulties. Chris, I'm sort of remembering this happened once with one of our projects and they just, we kind of said, come back in and talk to us after, like everything went forward, the construction went forward. We just said, come back, talk to us you know, after you've planted or something, I can't. Yeah, that's usually a condition yeah. of the permit. So um, this would give, this wording would give the uh, PGA um, authority to have such a condition, okay? 
Okay. Great, uh, Martha. Before we get yeah. going, going and then um, Stephanie, if you, if you could just at least for me in, enlarge the text a little bit, it would be great. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think maybe what Chris just said answers it, but I think we want some kind of wording so that the developer can just not kind of walk off and say, "Okay, we're done," before the screening is 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 really planted if there's some way that the PGA has to give some final stamp of approval even after the thing has been turned on just some kind of wording to indicate that the planting does have to be eventually done before the project is considered you know absolutely finished that's that would be all uh, cuz i i agree with Laura about the uh, the practicality yeah, I mean, maybe some language about um, completed, the planning should be completed before interconnection, unless otherwise authorized by the PGA, in which case it shall be completed no later than a year after the interconnection. Yeah, something, something like that. Yeah, Laura may have a better wording right yeah, here. And she has her hand up. So, Laura. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's good. The only thing I'm, I don't know if it's down here further along is um, it's one thing just to plan it, but obviously making sure that they maintain it and that it grows. Yeah, um, some sort of like check in because obviously that's the that's the spirit of this, not just yeah. throwing things on the ground. I think that sentence um, plants shall be maintained and replaced if unhealthy by the owner operator of the installation for the life of the installation. Yeah, that's good because what's going to happen here is the developer is oftentimes not the owner, so mm -hmm. this this responsibility is going to be passed on in the agreement to the asset owners. So I think that that's good. Okay, and um, it's unclear what kind of um, final document this gets from the building commissioner. Usually, like in the case of a building, the building commissioner grants a certificate of occupancy. Um, I asked one of the inspectors here and he said, well, in this case, um, there would probably be a, um, a final inspection. So um, it's not exactly as strict as getting a certificate of occupancy. So I'll have to go back to the building commissioner and ask him exactly how to would be the most, uh, the best way to word this. And in fact, when we get to the point of um, talking about next steps, uh, he's going to be one of the people who is going to be reviewing this and making sure that it all makes sense. So, so that'll be something that comes up at that time. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Uh, slope and soils, the LGPIs shall not be installed on slopes greater than 15%. That is three feet and 20 feet. And all soils must be kept on site. That was something that Martha was um, concerned about. Did you want to add a section about um, at not adding soils unless approved by the PGA? Off-site soils shall not be added. Well, his... I was actually responding to one of Scott Cashin's comments. He said, oh, yeah, so you have a requirement that soils shall not leave the site, so they'll all be dumped in a big pile at the edge of the site. So uh, he thought maybe there should be some different wording or not not have that requirement at all. I mean, what we wanted to avoid was somebody just coming in and stripping all the topsoil with the good stuff off and going and selling it somewhere. Uh, but it looks like we need some better wording altogether. Let's see if Jack has anything to shed yeah. light on this or, or another comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, this is interesting because uh, soils are uh, managed throughout the state, you know, based on their quality, number one. There's, there's, you know, rules and regulations in place with regard to best management practices. They call it the soil anti-degradation policy. But that's a different matter. I think what, you know, what you're talking about with, you know, soil being kept on site is, um, yeah. You, you don't want the topsoil uh, leaving, but so I guess we have to discuss that. But I, I was a, I was just going to point out that the slope. I mean, people can ask for variances, obviously, 
But the one about the slope, I'm, I'm wondering if we can kind of smooth out a, a little bit and say maybe it's 15% as averaged over oh. you know, a certain length of, uh, you know, certain footage. Uh, could be 50 feet, 100 feet. But just so they don't, we don't get, you know, in the weeds with, you know, the 15% thing. And this is interesting because it differs from what the um, water shed water supply protection committee said. They said you could go up to thirty three percent. They said one to three, I believe, or maybe it was thirty yeah, percent. For me, the fifteen percent seems like uh, really you know low. It's not like we're impacting. 30% definitely, you know that that's a hill, but 15%, I'm not sure we would recognize that that is something that is <laughs> significant. You know, certainly we're worried about erosion and things like that. 15% is, is it? That's it's not that much. steep, but that was something that the, uh, it, what was his name? Jonathan Thompson yeah. um, sa said he used eight degrees, which is, roughly the same as 14%. So he said you shouldn't plant on or uh, put the installation on something that's greater than eight degrees or 14%. So that's where we came up with this. So but yeah, I could say it's, unless it's, otherwise it's, authorized by the permit granting authority. And yeah. then also as averaged over, you know, I don't know, 100 foot, um, whatever distances. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, uh, yeah. Um, Jan, and then I wouldn't mind seeing if Laura has any um, so experience with, with this. I recall this was a recommendation of 15% um, by Jonathan Thompson. Um, and it seems, it seems prudent to me that you want to level the slope. So it controls like runoff and erosion and stormwater. I did notice a different number in a different part of the bylaw, and I thought we should just be uniform with the 15%. And I think, I don't know if there's some other place where it's like 15% over 100 feet, um, which I think gives you some chance for some variation. And, you know, in the NEET report, they did all these exclusions. Um, they were looking at Amherst land for solar, and they excluded all land that had a much um, more gradual slope. I can't remember if it was 7% or 6%. So, it does seem like a really important issue for stormwater management erosion. Um, you know, probably optimally when you want an array, you want it as flat as possible. Um, so I, I think we should be consistent. I think we should be fact-based too. Yeah, I'm gonna, I know Dwayne, you just um, pinged me. I'm actually gonna quickly go back and look through some documents of various projects in the past and I'll get back to you. So we can move on and then I'll come back to the question. Okay. All right. uh, I mean, control. would there be um, openness to the language that gives some out in terms of or approval by the PGA um, on this um, in, in some sites that might not be prone to erosion for various reasons <clears throat> that a higher slope could be tolerated for a site? Martha? Yeah, I feel I feel comfortable with Jack's suggestion of averaged over, you know, like a hundred feet or, or or some wording like that, uh, because I think that, you know, from other documents, I think other other um, bylaws do from other communities do have this in. I'm not, you know, I've seen that fifteen percent lots of places. I think, but it is true that it needs to be over a big average, you know. Okay. And I think, and I think um, in general, that's a good rule of thumb, but I'm also thinking, and I don't really, obviously the goal is to prevent erosion. And, um, but at the same time, like, I'm just thinking about, for example, all those solar facilities that are built along the highway, along the pike, that definitely have slopes greater than 15%, but it's a great use of land and it's, it's stable. Mm -hmm. um, so Let's just, my suggestion is let me just get a couple more pieces of information. I think that's, I, I agree with Martha that it should be, you know, on average. Um, but I always think it's good to, you know, for example, if you're building a site on a landfill, 
the slope is going to be greater than 15%. We all want it on landfills um, and we don't want to prohibit that. Um, so things like that, I do think we, we just need to be mindful of. Yeah. 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 Stephanie, what about the, the our own one at the transfer station on the landfill? Is that that's on a slope, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Laura, that's a good example. Maybe we could clarify with Jonathan. Maybe he was referring to um, farce. And we know that most farms are flat. So, but is Jonathan an expert on solar development? I thought he was an expert yeah. on forests. Yeah. Okay. He, so, I mean, sort of this is, I mean, he says, um, I don't, I won't speak to his expertise in solar, but I know he's worked there about this a lot. So sure. But I, I just think in general, like when we're considering the slope for solar projects, not just solar projects and forests, this is, this is a bylaw for everything. So we want to make sure we can develop on landfills. We want to make sure we could develop along busy roads that have, you know, I mean, I just think there's various, um, you know, uh, as long as you're putting in place like the stringent stormwater controls that go along with building something on a higher slope. Um, anyways, I just think we want to give ourselves some room here. So I think as long, I think the 15% is fine. Um, as long as we give this, you know, the committee the ability um, to approve certain projects, uh, special exceptions. Sorry, Martha, I was having trouble with my mouse. And um, yes, uh, I would say, you know, just from my experience in a regulatory position that, you know, these things are done case by case. So sometimes that kind of a blanket restriction might not make sense. You know, it depends on the site because sites can be very specific to what types of soils they are, how stable they are. So, I mean, I'm not advising one way or the other. I'm just saying that, you know, if you get too specific, you might lock yourselves in in a way that we don't necessarily want to. Okay. Um, what's next? Control of vegetation. Synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers may not be used to control vegetation or animals except as otherwise approved by the PGA. Um, so I don't know much about the difference between synthetic and organic uh, of these things. Um, I know that the um, uh, Water Supply Protection Committee did not want to have these things used anywhere near water supply. Um, I know that herbicides and pesticides were used or are going to be used at Hickory Ridge to tamp down existing vegetation so it can be um, planted with uh, pollinator vegetation. And that had to go before the Conservation Commission to get that approved. I think it might have gone before the Zoning Board of Appeals as well. So. I think we need to give um, you know, some leeway here, but I don't know if we should be saying a blanket uh, prohibition against synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, but allow organic. And maybe Jack has some insight into that. Um, and maybe Laura does. This is a point of reference, um, our pollinator friendly certification um uh, a process and requirement that's approved by the state and, and issued by umass we do allow for and I, I agree with you chris i don't know if it's specific, synthetic or otherwise um herbicides in limited cases for those particular reasons to get this the site uh established um there doesn't seem to be too many alternatives for that um but go ahead janet um, I think last week I had one, I, I want, I think um, I questioned whether we were allowed to do that if we were preempted by the state state pesticides act from um, putting in more rigorous requirements. So that was a Jonathan Murray question. And then I think I remember Scott Cation, who's now sort of a um, star at this hearing. <laughs> um, he was saying that some invasives just need the earth. You, you just need to eradicate using us, you know, a inorganic or a, 
synthetic pesticide, you know, herbicide. So there, there's some that just are so virulent that you have to use that. So I don't know, you might want to say preferred or encouraged or something, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if we can say it at all legally, but I, I think we should be flexible enough to actually eradicate things that we need to. So maybe yeah. the wording that we have here is okay. The synthetic you know, versions of these may not be used except as otherwise approved by the PGA. And then you'd have to come forward with the appropriate information to get PGA approval. Right? Okay. Yep, okay. yep. and uh, Jack, before we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, this reminded me of the obligation that Eversource has to uh, maintain the right of ways there for the high, uh, you know, transmission lines. I know it's evolved, but it's, you know, I guess, Chris, when you take this, you know, that, that might be a good thing to kind of look to parallel, you know, the practices that Eversource is using. Um, you know, for further right of ways. Thanks. Okay. And the next sentence, I don't know if it's necessary anymore. It was kind of a vestigial sentence before we had gotten into more description of agrivoltaics. But anyway, what this says is that PGA shall look positively or favorably on solar installations that include agrivoltaics or dual use. Is that necessary anymore, or should we just strike that? In my sense, since we have a whole section on that later, it kind of seems out of place and it doesn't doesn't add much to the document. That's my opinion too. Yeah. Okay. Now um, the next part is on special requirements for. Um, installations in forest lands and farmlands. Re ready for that? Um, okay, special requirements for large-scale ground-mounted photovoltaic installations in forest lands. Ecosystem protection. For all LGPIs, there shall be no forest clearing on land designated as core habitat and critical natural landscapes on Massachusetts GIS Biomap 3, 2022, or on land designated as priority habitat or estimated habitat as defined by Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. Um, is, that, is that reasonable? Any objections? No? Okay, forest clearing, limitations and mitigation. For land that is located in the RO, residential outlying, or RLD, residential low density zoning districts, and that is characterized by the on the Amherst GIS viewer as tree and forest vegetation. The cutting of more than 10 acres of trees for the purpose of installing an LGPI facility shall be prohibited unless the landowner, LGPI developer, or applicant can demonstrate to the PGA that one of the following types of mitigation will be established. I think we don't need to say one of the following types because we're eliminating one of the types, but I'll deal with that later. So the main type that we want to have as a mitigation is preservation of forested area elsewhere. For LGPIs that are five to 10 acres in size, a minimum, minimum area equal to one time the total area of forest land that is cleared is gonna be preserved. For LGPIs that are 10 acres in size or more, a minimum area equal to two times the total area of forest land that is cleared. And then we say, must remain as natural forested open space for the life of the project. This natural forested open space may be on the same lot as the LGPI or may be on another property in Amherst or on land in the town abutting Amherst. This area shall be clearly depicted on a site plan prepared by a registered land surveyor the land designated as natural forested open space shall be deed restricted for the life of the LGPI, and the deed restriction shall be recorded at the Franklin County or Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, whichever is applicable. 
the deed restriction shall not be lifted until the solar array has been decommissioned or the land has been revegetated with native tree and undergrowth species or has been established as farmland and has been stabilized for a period of five years after decommissioning. I think that was something that Scott Cashin recommended. We good with that? And we're talking about eliminating the payment in lieu because people felt that that was too complex. Is that correct? Um, looks like yeah. Jack and Janet yeah. have questions. Yeah, Jack, Laura, and then Janet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just one, uh, wondering about, um, you know, no, uh, I'm just going back to the, to the intro here, no force clearing and the, you know, from a practical manner, um, you know, it, I'm guessing, you know, would there be an opportunity or a need for like an access road through, you know, one of these designated areas and would that you know, be something that we would be concerned about or not. Um, but again, I know this is clearing for the for the solar, uh, you know, array. But again, there's some features there. I'm just wondering how how rigid uh, this is. Okay, and anyway, the, the trees that might have to be cut down for a road road access an access road would be included in the acreage under consideration oh well, i don't think that's another good point i you know I, it probably shouldn't be but also you know there there's fourth clearing that is that is peripheral to to the actual project and i, I just wondered how rigid this is and yep yep good point um, any thoughts on that? I mean, my, my sense is to leave it as the acreage of the, the footprint of the array. Yeah. The, the fence theory, or if there's a fence, <laughs> I guess we're not clear that there's always a fence, but uh, with some buffer where a fence would be. Um... Yeah. Okay. Um, Laura? I'm just going to go on record saying that um, I find, you know, I, I fully disagree with this part of the bylaw um, and I'm not going to fight to change it, but I just want to state my reasons why, which is one, if you're a farmer or a landowner and you want to put solar on your property and for, you know, whatever reason, it looks like it's a viable location. Um, you know, this is personal property rights get impacted here, but also it strikes me as extremely, um, of, as elitism that you're requiring someone to deed a similar size parcel of land. Whereas I certainly wouldn't have that capability financially, and I'm sure many others um, are in the same situation, certainly farmers. Um, and I also, you know, just for the record. You know, the size system that most developers have to put in the ground in order to make it, you know, make economic sense is five megawatts. And five megawatts requires somewhere between 30 and 35 acres. Hmm. Um, this isn't even half of that. So, again, I, I love our forests. We have a tremendous amount of forested land in Amherst. Um, that is, a, you know, protecting that land is the reason why I joined the Conservation Committee. But at the same time, we are, in my opinion, overly prohibiting um, the construction of much needed solar facilities. And I actually really do question if this is gonna come up in some sort of uh, legal case because um, the mitigation opportunities are, you know, extremely expensive that we're putting forth here, unless I'm missing something. Appreciate that, Laura. Um, Bob. Yeah, uh, you've heard this often before for me. Um, I really oppose this uh, section. I don't believe that we should require mitigation, uh, which is unique for solar development, but we wouldn't require that of any other type of development that would be of a similar size. I, I, I concur with everything that Laura said. This is just wrong. 
I appreciate that, Bob. And we might have to discuss this a little bit more soon. Uh, Janet? Um, so I, I was, I support this, you know, it, it for, a, you know, a million reasons that we sort of covered in other meetings. Um, and I don't think it's actually going to cover that much land in Amherst. And, um, in, you know, I mean, there's not there's not that much forested land in Amherst, and the person, the group that owns the land, could easily meet the mitigation requirements um, since they have a lot of land, a lot of forested land. So I'm not that worried about that. Um, you know, we know the whole state policy and the thinking has shifted to protecting forests and not cutting them down for solar, and I think that's um, hard to accept, but it's hard to argue with given the science and and the state plans and the the amount of solar capacity on the built environment but that's actually that's a comment in response to what people were saying but i also um might i i was just going to add to this section um on the mitigation um not to just to add a sentence saying you know it could be um you know if you're setting aside land for you know impermanent conservation for the life of the array why not also give them the option of permanently conserving it? So I would just add a sentence saying, you know, or a permanent, permanently protected land. So I don't want to take away the suggestion and the opportunity that someone just sets aside a land with a, a conservation restriction or um, so I just would add a sentence or a little clause into um, I think the second paragraph, I can't quite see the whole thing on my screen right now. So I just thought if somebody wants to do it permanently, Let's let's give them the suggestion and the opportunity, and that would meet the requirement for mitigation. I could, Jack. Yeah, on that on those lines, I think you know, I think a permanent thing would is you know is is a good thing is to be encouraged, but to, to incentive uh, incentivize. Sorry about that. <laughs> this pronunciation, but. Um, <laughs> But maybe make it like half the acreage if it's permanently, you know, to kind of take some of the burden off. If, so just adding on what Janet said, you know, I don't know how people feel about that. Jan, do you have anything specific on that before we go to Laura? Yeah, so, I, you know, I, I don't have my chart right here. I've been kind of furiously thinking, but all, all the towns around us have a four to one kind of set aside requirement. And so this is probably the most gentle of the area. And um, I think that they've gone through one of them, I think Belchertown's passed muster, muster with the AG. And also they have a cap on how many acres you can clear, which is like 10, which is not to say the AG is not the SJC who are the final people, but it's it shows something. But four to one is the ratio used by Belchertown, I think Shootsbury, I, I could, I might go off screen and just, you know, ferret through my files a little bit, but I know that four to one was like used by three or four towns around us. Right, Laura. Yeah. So Dwayne, my, my, what I have certainly seen, they suggested it early on, but I'm just surprised and I'd be curious to hear Bob's feedback here. Um, but why we wouldn't specifically, rather than just say 10 acres, and, and not defining what that is as far as like tree growth, you know, why wouldn't it be trees taken down class by diameter or something like that? Less than six inches is something, you know, 12 to 18, you know, something like that, which is what I certainly see in, in a lot of, you know, in a lot of communities across the country, not just in Massachusetts. But I also want to point out that there are times throughout the the bylaw group where I feel like um, I just want to make sure this is being constructed or drafted not in response to I know there's a lot of you know high emotion around the larger project proposed in Amherst and Shrewsbury by Cowles and I know Janet you had just referenced um, that you know particular landowner but I'm just thinking about all the landowners you know I, I just want to make sure we're drafting this so that um, it doesn't prohibit or support any particular project because, um, you know, there could be other landowners who don't have the financial wherewithal to set aside another 10 acres of land, so. 
Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> I guess my own take on this is, is uh, I, I guess I'm very concerned about putting this out there without having us uh, um, as a as a requirement for solar development where it's not a requirement for other developments of say 10 acres or more. It does seem to be um, unfair and potentially um, would encourage landowners who want to make uh, develop their land to go with um, options that might be um, more permanently destroy, destroying the, the forest in, in the form of housing and so forth. So I, I think I've raised that before. Um, that wouldn't be appropriate in this bylaw, but maybe a, a mention to the side that the um, uh, committees and the council should consider similar um, requirements for other uh, uses of forests. Um, I do have sympathy for the concerns about land, I guess, landowners and their ability to make decisions on their properties. Um, and also, I, I guess I wouldn't mind if anybody has information about what the um, cost is of this requirement. Um, Laura, you sort of made some reference to that um, and whether that is a significant cost that would um, just raise the price of solar, raise the price of solar for ratepayers. Um, uh, or, or perhaps um, reduce solar development. Um, I'm also, you know, this the state definitely is, as we know, giving attention to um, maintaining um, and and their their own investment and and uh, uh, programs to provide for the um, uh, protection of natural and working lands. Um, I guess what's unknown to us is what is the state going to be doing apart from solar development to keep that pace of sequestration up on, on natural and working lands uh, and whether that is really their job as opposed to the solar developer's job uh, to do that. Uh, so I, I have sympathies on both sides on this. Um, Laura? Laura? No, I was just going to say, Dwayne, I, I think the, the economic analysis that you alluded to, um, I think that's, you know, we don't have time here to do an economic analysis, but I think we can all agree that preserving an equivalent parcel of land in Amherst is going to be very expensive. Um, so, that you know, uh, I don't think it would take long to put together some figures there. All right, thanks. Um, Janet and then Jack. Um, just just wanted to note that this this bylaw will not affect the Shootsbury Road project since it's already been filed and it's going to go under existing zoning. I think that um, 10,000 an acre for forest land is a good rough estimate that was given to me by a um, one of the land trusts. I want to ask, you know, farmland is more valuable than forest land. Um, and then, you know, I don't think it's a huge amount of money in the context of putting an array when, you know, I was talking to somebody and their interconnection cost was $2 million. And so there's, you know, so even though it, you know, 10,000 an acre to buy the land, not just the land, you know, it would be cheaper maybe for the land, the development rights, but um, in the grand scheme of financing and, and profitability, I don't think it's a huge thing. 10,000 acre meeting for 10 acres would be $100,000. Yeah, um, I, mean, I think to buy, I think to buy, so. All right, um, yeah, Jack. Jack. Yes, uh, I'm just wondering if we have a, a math problem with the acreage when we're talking about, you know, when you're including the, you know, the fenced area. I mean, how clear is this in the bylaw? In terms of when we're technically saying five acres, and then like in this paragraph, we're saying no, uh, the cutting of more than 10 acres of trees for the purpose of installing the LDPI. But if you're going to have a 10 acre facility, to me, that's 10 acres within the fenced area. And then you, there's no way you, you have to cut more trees than, than 10 acres to put in a 10 acre facility. So we got, we got a math problem here that's going to. Unless I'm confused, but um, is is that right, Chris? Am I reading that right? I think there needs to be some clarity about that. What I was thinking was that the 
GPI included the fenced in area, which would include, you know, all of the land that was cleared and not just the area of the solar panel. So that's what I am thinking about when I'm writing this, but it may not be clear. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we, yeah. Go ahead, Jack. Well, I'm just I'm just saying that that um, that's making for some very small arrays. If that's what we're setting up, yeah. and I doesn't seem workable. Well, this is only applicable for arrays ten acres or more, right? Or is it five acres? Sorry. It's applicable to five acres or more. This is something we discussed yeah. last week yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. as breaking it up into anything less than five acres wouldn't be counted, but anything five acres to 10 acres would have certain requirements and anything from 10 acres and larger would have other requirements. So yeah. this is what <clears throat> was being suggested at last week's uh, meeting. We're also putting in, we're, we're, we're hardwiring in buffer zones that suggest that that um, is part of the project. I think the buffer zone is outside of the fence. The buffer zone is, um, you know, the fence is starts at the uh, 30 foot setback from the property line. That's my understanding of this. So anything inside of the fence is part of this measurement and anything outside of the fence is not part of this measurement. So does the, the, the developer need to have control over the buffer zone in terms of ownership? No, I don't think so. Okay. Probably he would. He would either lease it or buy it, and he would have control over it, but it wouldn't be part of this um, installation because it would be a treed area 30 foot wide, right? Am I? Are we counting the access? This isn't regarding my hand being raised, but a question on this exact topic. Are you counting like the interconnection easement? Sometimes you have to run a line, you have to get an easement in order to interconnect the system. Um, what is counted here? Um, because so, there's there's a lot of additional acreage sometimes that comes in addition to just the fenced in area. Yeah. And then we, we're, we're going to have a battery facility. Usually the battery uh, is inside the fence. But I think yeah. Laura's right that, you know, to question is the interconnection easement and the roadway also part of this? And that's not something that I had um, considered. I would yeah, say I think we can either um, put in language to kind of really define what acreage we're talking about um, or keep it the, an easily defined uh, area like the fence area and just use work with our multiplier to make it a, a reasonable number that, that we want. You know, maybe it's not one to one, maybe it's 1.2 to one uh, to account for these auxiliary uh, parts that are being um, cleared as well on a rough basis, not, not necessarily project by project. Uh, I'm just not sure whether it's, uh, or we could define, you know, trees that are cut, you know, then it's like, you know, sometimes the access lines are going through areas which have trees, sometimes the, the they may not be trees. Um, so it becomes a little bit harder to clearly define as a rule. Um, the way this was originally written before last week was that it only applied to areas that were LGPIs that were 10 acres of size or more. And those were required to have, um, I think it was one to one. Yeah. Um, and then we changed it to be more you know, specific. And so maybe we want to go back to 10 acres or more one to one uh, mitigation. Um, let's hear from, um, I think Laura had her hand up and then Janet and then Thanks. Martha. Thanks, Wayne. Um, you know, so I think there's a, a couple of things here. Um, given the fact, so this language essentially is going to greatly restrict solar development in Amherst. The fact that you're calling out an acreage of this size, um, the the actual 
um, and, and I don't know how we've defined forest here. I mean, you know, so I think that's a very important piece, but basically what it is saying is if there's a parcel of land, and again, there's not very many parcels of land where you can actually interconnect a facility, it's going to have to be quite a bit smaller than what we're seeing being developed across the state in order to meet, meet minimum um, thresholds in terms of, Janet, you mentioned a $2 million interconnection. Um, that is unfortunately the norm now. That has nothing to do, that's just what the utility is making you pay to upgrade the lines. Um, but the smaller the project size from five megawatts, the less likely it is to be developed. Um, and that $100,000 fee you just mentioned is a tremendous amount for a project that's two, that's two megawatts, 1.5 megawatts, whatever that is. That is absolutely not insignificant. And my other question is, um, and I kind of just, you know, for me, this is the town council will make their decisions, but um, I'm really not supportive of this language. Um, I, uh, anyways, I think, I think those are, those are, those are some of the, the bigger uh, pieces to consider. I had another point, I forgot it, but if it comes back to me, I'll, I'll surface it. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, Martha and then Janet. Yes, okay. I mean, this is, 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 is clearly a difficult uh, concept here, um, but so let me say several things. Normally, no, what this means and what the intention was when we started out with this section is the amount of forest land that is clear cut for the array. We're not talking about the array size. We're talking about the amount of forest land that has to be cleared for the moment, never mind the access roads. But uh, and normally that's about two to one compared to the actual size of the array. And that was based on the report at the UMass Solar Forum, the survey that had been done over the past 10 years is that generally it was about twice as much forest land cleared as the literal array size. So that's what we're talking about here is the amount of forest land cleared. So uh, second, second point being that uh, clearly the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is very concerned about the amount of forest that has been cleared over the past decade, both for solar and for development. Um, and they're saying this should not continue in the same way. And that was very clear from all the sessions of the Solar Forum at, at UMass and all of the state agencies, all of the research, the, um, you know, the Audubon, Mass Audubon's latest report, Nature Conservancy, as well as the state documents. Uh, but then the practical aspect here in Amherst is really, except for the one site that's under consideration now that you know we know of and not going to discuss, is that there really isn't all that much clear forest land here in Amherst. Um, that's going to be affected for size. Certainly there's no other place that I know of in Amherst where there could be uh, a large array such as Laura that you're referring to as the large arrays being the more profitable ones per uh, kilowatt or megawatt, whatever. Uh, and the the in fact, the bylaw is saying that the land that could be then set aside, could be in any one of the surrounding communities. And as Janet pointed out, it could be land that then gets donated as a permanent um, conservation area for which you then get some you know, financial state rebate and so on. So I feel fairly strongly that this uh, language in these statements and the mitigation should be in here for the cleared forest land with the two to one greater than 10 acres and the one to one greater than five acres. Um, and that is in, fa in fact, there probably won't be cases here, right here in Amherst, uh, where this becomes uh, challenging. So I guess that's my, 
Okay. So I would prefer to leave it as the wording is now and make clear that we're talking about the amount of land that is being clear cut, not the size of the array. All right, thanks. Um, let me throw out one idea, uh, and I don't want to derail this direction, but it just dawned on me, and maybe it's a different direction. Um, I guess I do have some, you know, just philosophical concerns, I guess, as these solar developers are the ones we are counting on to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions um, substantially. Keep in mind, these arrays provide a great deal of carbon mitigation relative to the forced um, sequestration. Um, and that um, just philosophically, it doesn't seem right to me to put the burden of additional sequestration on them. Uh, that should come from the community as a whole, taxpayers as a whole, the Commonwealth as a whole, and really work with the Commonwealth. Um, the Commonwealth should really be uh, doing this in terms of, of how they're going to go about protecting all this uh, natural and working lands um, and not put that burden on solar developers who we need to uh, really uh, do the lion's work of meeting the greenhouse gas emission reductions that we need. Um, my idea, I wouldn't put it as a proposal because I don't know if it's um, what all the um, uh, objections might be, but is um, as a different approach is to um, state that um, all land cleared forest land cleared for solar development needs to be put in permanent um, protection, that land itself. Uh, so that after the array, they, the landowner makes their money off the array. After the array, it's either reestablished as an array or put into farming, uh, but otherwise um, it needs to be permanently sequestered uh, or protected, I guess, as natural and working lands, just as an idea. Um, and not bother with offsets. That's in my mind, the state should be um, really working on protecting natural and working lands separate from solar development. All right. So comments on that or anything? Uh, I didn't mean to derail. Um, uh, Janet, and then Chris, you had your hand up. Let's go with Chris first, please. So in terms of the um, definition, I was thinking that you could say. For LGPIs that are that involve five to ten acres of clearing, or that involve ten acres or more of clearing, and that would um, that would clarify what we're talking about in terms of the size. So I'm just making that suggestion. Great, um, Janet, and then Laura, and then Martha. So I think the language in there saying in the first paragraph is pretty clear. It's not limiting itself to like the land under the panels or inside the fence, but it's talking about the cutting of more than 10 acres for the purpose of installing an LGPI facility. So that would include access roads and, and the like. And so I, I don't know if we need to clarify that language. What we need to do is agree on it, you know, <laughs> and is, you know, and, you know, basically I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, and so, so I just want to make that point. The second point is Martha has a good point about there's a lot of federal, there's a lot of tax benefits to to acquiring land and putting it into permanent protection, and um, the federal government will handsomely let you um, take you know whatever the value of your donation is and spread it over your tax liability of ten years and things like that. So it's not like you know if you're paying ten thousand for the development rights it's not necessarily out of pocket. And so, um, and sometimes people put together CPAC and, you know, state funding arrangements and stuff like that. So pushing that aside, I, I do think that, you know, we know most of these arrays are going to be arrays for 30, 50 years, especially the large ones. No one's going to put tens of millions of dollars into projects. And then, you know, I mean, you, wouldn't you just replace the panels as they age? And I, I, you know, so I think that this is really taking land out of use as a forest. And as Martha has said, all we've been, you know, all we have seen for the last year or two is in our state climate action plans in the no net loss of forests and farmlands policy. Um, in our own town climate action and resilience plan says put solar on the built environment to protect natural working lands. And so I would love to say, you know, to the state of Massachusetts, 
you know, protect all those lands. Um, you know, it's not going to be permanently, it's not going to be comprehensively protected by changing incentives, but there's nothing that stops for the town of Amherst saying it in order to implement our own climate action plan approved by ECAC, approved by the town council. We know the science is super important that, that forests are sort of mega stars, not just in, in sequestration, actually the mega stars are really wetlands, which are all throughout our forests. But they're, they're sort of superstars in terms of mitigating climate change, modulating temperatures, you know, clean, filtering water, producing air, um, you know, you know, mitigating flooding, mitigating drought, um, you know, providing habitat for us as well as species and plants and the whole thing. And so it's clear that these lands should be protected. And I think at the end of the day, we're not talking about that much land in Amherst. And so if you if we go on to the mapping, there's not that much forest land. Shootsbury take Shootsbury Road off the map, it's really not going to affect that much land. And so I don't know. I think this is, you know, to me, this has to be done to for me to support this bylaw. I don't know, you know, how, you know, I don't know, I don't understand how we can go to the town council and saying, forget the town action plan, climate action plan, forget all the state plans, forget all the science, forget the fact that we have barely put any solar on any commercial or town property, we have to cut down this forest and we won't even compensate or mitigate for it in this sort of simple way. All right. Um, yeah, Laura. So I think I um, just want to lead by saying that, of course, um, all my comments now, you know, I have, I grew up in Berkshire County. It's like 90% forested and from a personal approach, you know, I grew up on those forests and there's certainly a desire to want to marry solar development with protecting forested land. Um, but a few points that I think absolutely need to be raised. Um, in my experience with solar across the country, we regularly lose out to housing developments. So, you know, and I'm not sure the extent, so I hear on one hand that there's actually not a lot of land that this would impact. On the other hand, it makes me wonder why we're including it, if that's the case. Um, but it is very typical that um, when a landowner is seeking to develop solar, if that property has water rights or anything that could make it permissible for housing development, um, I know there's this conception that solar, and by the way, the maximum size of a solar project in Massachusetts is in no way considered big solar, just for the record. Um, if a landowner is looking to make the most amount of money by leasing or selling their land, solar doesn't even come close to what you would make from a housing development. So I, I, do, I do have a philosophical disagreement with putting additional restrictions on solar development, that is, which is actually a climate benefit than we do in any other types of development in the town. Um, and hopefully that's rectified. I think the second piece is, um, you know, if we're going to include anything like this, we need to define what is clear cut. What's the diameter of the tree? I think we've heard from from Bob and even from Dan that not all forests are created equal. And the last thing I'd ever want to do is put out bylaw language where you have small little trees on a parcel of land and we're defining that as clear cut. Um, because as we all know here, and we've heard from all the experts, not all forested land is created equal. Um, and, this, and the third piece, which I think is an equity issue, is the mitigation requirements that we're requiring here. Who is responsible for doing that? So the landowner is not going to have money to buy another piece of land and donate it. The developer absolutely doesn't have money. I mean, if a landowner is approached, if a developer approaches a landowner, and the landowner says, you know what, I don't want to lease my land. I want you to buy it if you're going to develop solar. Nine times out of 10, the developer does not have the capital to buy the land, period. So I'm not sure at what point in the development process this would be a requirement. But, you know, in the rare exception of a landowner who's flush with cash, and then in the very rare exception where you have a developer that has cash that can be used for real estate, this is not something that's achievable. Um, so, you know, knowing that I'm all for protected forested lands, I think if, you know, if, if we're going to include anything like this, um, 
I, I would just need more, um, it does require more work of which we don't have time to do. Um, so Duane, I don't know at what point we take this to a vote, um, but uh, we could spend, I think the next hour and a half talking about this. Yeah, um, so let's get close to that. But uh, if we if we think we're gonna need a vote, I just wanted to uh, maybe before Martha go, just you know, agree with uh, with with Janet in that you know uh, natural working lands, the forests are our superstars with regard to carbon sequestration. Um, that being said, um, the real superstars in addressing our climate crisis is renewable energy generation, uh, for which our um, reductions in greenhouse gases are, are that's going to account for 80, 90 percent of where we need to go and 10 to 20 percent will be through carbon uh, sequestration for the net reduction for the net zero uh, requirements uh, so we need renewable energy generation that's our superstars to some extent to, to a large extent um, and um, uh, and that is to replace our entire fossil fuel uh, uh, infrastructure uh, for power generation twice over uh, and so, um, you know, these technical studies which have been coming out suggesting this all goes on the built environment has to bear, obviously we want to push this as much on the built environment, but to the extent that we can meet our goals with only the built environment um, is very much up to question. I don't think, I, I've never heard the state say that they don't think we need any forest land uh, to be used for, for renewable energy generation. So I just wanted to lay that out there for some um, uh, consideration as well. Um, so let's have um, one more comment and then maybe um, uh, Martha, and then um, see just as a consensus of the group of whether uh, we need to sort of vote on this um, and exactly what would be, what would we would be voting on, uh, Martha. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, Laura, I certainly sympathize with 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 your points, but I, I and with you know everybody has made valid points, but I think we are at the point where what we've learned is that over the past decade, sixty percent of all solar panels have been built on forested land. That's what several people said at the UMass forum, and that this can't continue. So Massachusetts is really trying in their best way at the speed that the government works to change things, change the uh, the attitude toward where we put solar, try then to change the incentives, which is really what we need, so that there will be better incentives to building on parking lots and other places and so on. And Dwayne, you've certainly made this point, that's what we need. But in the meantime, I mean, we are part of Massachusetts, the last I knew. Uh, and so I think have some responsibility to where Massachusetts is going. And also, I believe we have a responsibility to our town residents who have come out resoundingly strongly opposed to cutting more forests here. And uh, I don't think we can separate ourselves from that. Uh, and um, you know, once once the forest is cut, it's not going to grow back. I agree with Laura that we really would need to define forest and tree size and so on more carefully. But, you know, practically, we're not talking about much land in Amherst. And I feel really strongly that we need to include these statements here that I don't think there are uh, very many landowners here in Amherst that you know, would have five acres or more that they want to put into solar that's now forested and that, that the uh, landowners that do have forest land uh, would have land in surrounding towns and so on that they could donate. Uh, so I, I do not see that this is a really huge financial impact. And I really think we have to go in the direction that really benefits, you know, our community and Massachusetts. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Stephanie, let me ask you just in terms of a process question. Um, um, or just what what were the consensus of the group? Do you, um, should we, the, I think the question with regard to potential um, 
consensus or, or voting of the group is this section that's up on the screen, uh, which I think is enumerated as one, um, or I guess it's this whole forest clearing limitation mitigation section. Uh, maybe, Stephanie, you can scroll just up and down a little bit on that to see the extent of that section um, and whether we would want to um, include that section in our bylaw um, with that section would require, uh, and maybe we need to also talk about defining these things, but with this section would require that the acreage of, of land clearing in, in forests that are specified, um, wasn't there some reference to a map here in terms of how they would be ref, uh, um, Yeah, as, as tree and forest vegetation on the G Amherst GIS viewer, as tree or forest vegetation, that would be the definition of, of what land would be um, subject to this requirement. Um, and that if it's, um, and the acreage, and I think our mind is really the, the total acreage of land clearing, I would so just my personal opinion to make it relatively easier is to have that as the uh, uh, array, the fence and, and and any buffer beyond the fence, but not including the linear, more linear cutting of uh, of transmission distribution lines or, or access roadways, because that gets a little bit harder to measure, I believe, and probably may not add up to as much. Um, and for acreage, either in this five to 10, or 10 and above category. So we could vote on either to include that language or to um, not have language at all uh, with regard to this mitigation requirement. Um, any, I'm not sure of how we, uh, if we wanna pose that in a, uh, in a motion uh, more better stated than I just said, um, but um, let's quickly hear from Janet and then Bob, please. Um, I, I was actually raising my hand because I found my so my solar bylaw comparison. So Belchertown has a maximum fenced area of twenty acres and a maximum forest clearing of ten acres. Um, Hadley and Pelham didn't have any, I'm not sure about Shootsbury, it says no, but I think Shootsbury might have changed that. I kind of lost that process. In terms of forest mitigation, Belcherton had four times the clear forest. Hadley had nothing, which I don't think Hadley has any forest. And then Pelham had four times the clear forest and Shootsbury had four times the cleared forest. So we're actually allowing larger arrays and we're and clearing and then we're our mitigation is the lowest um Amongst I, our very I, proximate towns you know okay. i'm i'm kind of confused because i know some people have been missing meetings but you know Dwayne, i thought you supported these mitigation requirements and actually the language that's in red was from you and so are you changing your thinking from past meetings i, I i'm just a little confused about why we've been kind of working on this language and mitigation for several meetings and also it looks like it's really up for grabs in a way that I thought was pretty settled except for the missing members yeah so I, mean, um, I, I don't know I'm not sure I've been um you know I, I personally I wasn't always uh fully on board with this need for mitigation I sort of felt like that's where you know I'm, I'm comfortable going in that direction if that's sort of the consensus of the group um again I I, I, I do have concerns about it uh it may force as was pointed out before people going with housing development as opposed to solar development um I do believe as a policy perspective it should be um an activity that is born as a forest preservation, natural working land preservation should be an activity and a policy that is borne by the, the Commonwealth and, and the constituents of the Commonwealth at large, not placed on the shoulders of solar developers who are our champions in fighting climate change. Um, and um, so those are my concerns. Those are my concerns. You haven't really answered. I mean, I don't know. I'm just surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I am too. I thought we'd settle this. 
Well, didn't. we didn't. We uh, we're we're settling it now, uh, uh, apparently. And let's uh, and I've heard you know certainly some um, counter arguments and and concerns and and uh, um, folks that are not a uh, not uh, um, approving of this language on our um, working group as well. So let me hear from uh, Bob. Yeah, just to bring this to a close, I just want to say I'm opposed to the whole concept of mitigation that's unique to solar development. Yeah. All right, Chris. I just wanted to say that there's a lawsuit pending, um, and I believe it involves Shootsbury and Pelham, um, and it involves the uh, four to one mitigation and probably other things as well. So even though um, you know, that may or may not have passed muster with the AG's office. The AG is just looking at this from a form and legality standpoint, um, but it is being challenged in the court. So just wanted to say that. So four to one is not a benchmark that we should necessarily look to. Thank you. Good, okay, uh, Jack. Yeah, I, I just like to remind everyone that I, I think we all were on board, you know, with protection of, of you know the, these contiguous areas in the in the biomap three which are that's a lot and so now we're looking at like fringe you know for us I understand that we still, still can look at the individual trees and the quality in that but we are uh, making a major I think as a group uh, agreement that those large areas that are generally contiguous with large forest tracts, uh, will not be developed. So that's a lot uh, right there. Um, and then the other, you know, the other thing that I'm a little confused about, again, is the setbacks that we're, we're putting in here just to develop these things 100 feet. You know, it's like we're, we're further segmenting, you know, these forests when we're putting these huge off, you know, uh, setbacks. But, you know, so Chris, there's buffers and then there's setbacks. There's, you know, those, <laughs> I'm seeing these in here. So I understand a setback is from the property line. So it just seems, you know, I'm wondering, like we're, we're, we're going in different directions with regard to what we're trying to do here. Um, by, you know, pushing a, a solar development further into a, a forest just to comply with a setback, an arbitrary setback, but uh -huh. my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, Bob, did you have something else to add? Okay, maybe your hand's still up. Okay. You're muted, sorry. Okay. All right, um, Chris. I wanted to point out that, um, yes, Jack is right, that we do have, beyond this section, there's a, a large area of um, blank page. But if you scroll down, I don't know who's in control now. Is this Stephanie or? Yes. or did, uh, OK, so Stephanie, if you can scroll down past the yellow and then past the blank. To the next page at the very top, it says setbacks for LGPIs in forest land. For all the LGPIs located in forest land that are over five acres in size, a 100 foot buffer of uncleared land shall be maintained between the LGPI that should be and the public roads and residential properties. So we did add that recently. So that speaks to Jack's point. Just wanted to make sure you saw that because it's kind of hidden. Right. Okay. All right. Okay, do we, um, how would you like to proceed? We could we could sort of take a bit of a straw poll first uh, in terms of where we are. I, I, I will let you know that I'm, I'm inclined to um, leaning against this provision uh, for the reason that I've stated, um, uh, primarily because um, again, I don't want to put this burden on shoulder developers. I want to put it on the Commonwealth and all the constituents of the Commonwealth um, uh, and not set up perverse um, 
incentives for developers to think about housing development and more more permanent um, uh, use of their lands. Um, so do we want to um, take a vote on this then? Are we ready to do that? Um, I see, uh, Chris, did you have another comment to make? No, sorry. Oh, nope. Sorry, yeah, no, no worries. Um, Janet um, and, Martha, and Martha. I think I just want to make, a, you know, sort of build on what Martha was saying. We have a survey that told us that you know, almost to the same, every person wanted to protect forested lands that, you know, the state survey had the same thing. We have our own climate action plan that Laura and you like served on and wrote, and then it was approved by town council. Um, and it says, you know, I mean, I'm quoting when these lands, natural working lands are developed or degraded, not only does the carbon stored in trees, plants and soil gets soils get released, but the future capacity of that land to sequester carbon is significantly and often permanently limited. Therefore, protecting our natural working lands is one of the most important things we can do to mitigate climate change. And later on, it says, talks about the need for a, a town bylaw. This can ensure the protection of highest and best use values of natural lands while facilitating emissions reduction and retaining co-benefits. Some of the ecosystem service values that a well-crafted solar zoning bylaw can protect include drought resilience, wildlife habitat, agricultural productivity, flood storage capacity, carbon sequestra sequestration, and more. This, I mean, this is, you know, we were asked by the town council to do a bylaw. We're implementing the town plan. We're eating, implementing state plans. We're implementing state policies. We're what the community wants. And I don't know, I just, and these are, these are the plans that, you, you know, you, you and Laura helped draft and, and pass and recommend. So I'm sort of at a loss of why we're reversing course and going against so many, so many well thought out plans and ideas and opinions and science. So I'm just, you know. Well, at least for, for your yeah, I I didn't create any of those climate action plans. I didn't serve on any of those boards. Just FYI. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for um, clarification, there. I mean, I I have, and and certainly um, that language is important um, to really um, uh, assure and 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 motivate the town of Amherst uh, and the constituents with the in the town of Amherst to protect and and uh, uh, um, conserve our open and 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 working and forest lands. Um, the state, the, the the town is doing a, a very good job on that historically and continues to do so. Um, do keep in mind that the um, carbon mitigation plan for the town also includes um, substantial uh, needs and support for uh, renewable energy generation to re to eliminate our green our fossil fuel use in town, um, and uh, and so that's the part of the climate action plan that you don't reference as much. Janet, um, and uh, but also is is uh, is critically important, and we've done analysis in terms of of what that might look like in terms of of uh, uh, solar development and other renewables uh, and energy efficiency in town, um, and uh, and certainly ECAC will and is supporting uh, solar development on the built environment, um, uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, but um, we're not uh, sort of looking to um uh make it difficult and burdensome to develop solar in in town as well all right martha yes just a, a comment to put this in perspective if you look at the state documents and surveys the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions is transportation that's almost 40 percent the next biggest source is our buildings heating the buildings, et cetera, et cetera. The contribution of electricity generation to the fossil fuel emission in Massachusetts is less than 20% and, and going down. So if we really care about reducing fossil fuel emissions, we should stop driving. We should be working hard on you know, converting our buildings. We should be doing the things that matter most and remind that in order to reach net zero, 
we have to really increase the carbon sequestration. Now, granted, that's mostly wetlands, but forests protect the wetlands. We need the forests. We see how the Amazon is burning. Uh, uh, I've just read an article that it, it may be past the point of of no return. The combination of the drought plus the clearing may mean that our biggest sink of greenhouse gases on the planet is being destroyed with our, beyond repair. So this is a much bigger issue than just re, at the moment uh, putting up solar panels, which you know admittedly help. And Dwayne, I agree with you that what the town needs then is to have consistent rules about mitigation for all kinds of of development that's beyond our purview, but we can certainly uh, make a recommendation to to that effect, and that would address your concern here that we're somehow singling out solar. So that's my perspective. We have to look at the big picture as well as what Janet said yeah. about our own uh, priorities. Yeah. Let me just add to the to that. Uh, thank you for that, Martha. Um, I guess two things. One is I would not at all be opposed to making a recommendations that uh, some mitigation is uh, of this sort is provided to all development. I wouldn't necessarily suggest we single out solar at this point, uh, but maybe um, uh, I'll put that as a recommendation coming out of this um, deliberation. Uh, second, I would say that to the extent that we don't all stop driving and we don't all stop heating our homes, yes. um, all, that all that fossil fuel is now going on the in the plan is going on their electricity system. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's uh, so that, you know, the uh, whatever percentage of greenhouse gas is 20% that's currently coming from our electric uh, power system. It's going to be, um, you know, uh, in order to drive electric vehicles, heat our homes with heat pumps, um, we need to have the electric system uh, double in size um, and, um, uh, uh, supported by renewable energy, um, and and so that's and again that's um, um, is accounts for 80 80 percent or so of the of the uh, carbon mitigation plan for the Commonwealth. Um, uh, the the carbon sequestration is important uh, important for many reasons uh, beyond carbon sequestration but is still um, sort of there to net out what we can't uh, scrub out uh, with the fossil fuels. Um, okay, um, that's sort of my perspective uh, to add to everybody else's. Um, shall we move to a vote on this? And are we prepared to do that? Yeah, can, can you very clearly state what we are going to vote on then very clearly? <laughs> Um, maybe with the help of of, of uh, any final language here from uh, from the document on the screen, um, Chris. I think you're really voting on a concept. You're voting on the concept of whether there should be mitigation for forest clearing. So I don't know if the details are all that important. That's just my opinion. But I do have, if you do decide you need the details, I can add some words. Yep. I mean, maybe that's a good point. Is that we don't need um, we don't need the details. We need we need to vote on the concept here. So should we put a motion on the floor, or the screen, or whatever we are? Can I can I just ask a um, clarifying question? Please, if, if we are in favor of mitigation for clearing. Um, forest and forest as being defined as something that's not currently included in this document. Um, but we also know that we're not going to have the time here to develop that part of the um, bylaw. Who does that? So let's say we, if the vote is we're in favor of, you know, some sort of mitigation, um, which I would be, um, but I'm not in favor of what's outlined here. What happens then? Good point. Good question. Well, I think the I, as I'm reading this, um, I mean, at least at this point, if we agree on it, if it, it would be um, the land in question is fairly well defined, uh, that it's it's in this first paragraph. 
it's in these two zoning okay. districts and that so, is characterized so we're, we're, by so we're voting on this language really yeah yeah uh yeah 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 to include this or not basically okay all right um so is is that a sufficient motion or should i turn that into a formal motion i think we need a clear motion I, i'm not really i'm a little lost so i mean are you proposing a motion Dwayne, or just I, I'm, I'm lost well let me uh let me propose a motion then we can uh amend it from there but the um the motion on the floor the motion would be to uh to vote on whether or not so a yay vote is to include and a nay vote is not to include uh this language um language in the solar bylaw in the solar bylaw that provides for the mitigation of forced uh, um yeah um that provides for the mitigation of forced land forest clearing um for solar development uh in the form of preservation uh preservation of forest land elsewhere uh did someone read that back I, it, it 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 might be more clear if you made a motion to include this language or exclude this language but i'm i'm can you can well, we could do that that might be a better a more clear motion uh if and we can, can i can read it i can read it back or you can change the motion okay which would you prefer doing uh i i can i guess i'd rather a motion on this specific language uh if we can just do that um so the motion would be to include or not the language that is currently in our draft uh in this section that is entitled Forest Clearing Limitations and Mitigation. Okay, just give me one second. Okay, so your motion is to include or not include the language currently in the draft section entitled Forest Clearing and Limit limitations and mitigation in the draft solar bylaw dated October 9th, 23. I just added to be clear. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand the, I just don't understand. <laughs> so, so I'd like to make a motion. Yeah, um, I, I, it's very unclear so, to me how to say. Yeah, so, so the motion is, and Jack, I'm sorry, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Sorry. I thought there is a motion. I was going to second it. <laughs> okay, good. Good. <laughs> All right. Is there any discussion on the motion first? So this is specifically the language that starts forest clearing dash limitations and mitigation and goes down for the land that is located in these residential zones, goes down through there and ends with the statement the vegetated buffer may be included in the open space calculation. Is that right? Yeah, what, what's below that, I presume, is a whole other yeah, section. Yeah, what's below that? Section. Uh, Dwayne, can I recommend, because it is confusing to say to include or not. So I would... Yeah. Say, I would maybe revise that to say in, to say to include yes. the language currently in draft section entitled forest clearing limitations and mitigation in the solar bylaw draft dated October 9th, 2023. Yeah. yeah. Um, and can you scroll okay. down and let us see if there's anything. Let's just confirm that. The yeah, there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing. It's a new section. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There was one more thing having to do with setbacks. Yeah. That we talked that, about a minute, uh, a few minutes ago. Oh, yeah, that right thing here? at the top yeah. of the page. Yeah. Okay. I would like to not include that setback section in our motion right now. Yeah, I think that's okay. a different section. Yeah. Okay. And I get is it clear that the um, track changes of that what's crossed out is 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 crossed out? Yeah. 
for the purpose of this voting. Okay, so that's the motion. Um, and given that it's revised, do you, um, I'm not sure, do we have them? You know, do you wanna ask for a second? Because I'm not sure, I know Jack seconded it, but I don't think it was a clear motion. <laughs> yeah, I think it's clear now. Um, and with, with the language that, uh, uh, to whether to include this or not, or to the motion is to include this. You had it well stated, Stephanie. <laughs> Okay. Does anyone need me to read it one last time, just to be clear? I think clarity would be a good idea. Thanks, thanks, Stephanie. To include the language currently in the draft section entitled Forest Clearing Limitations and Mitigation in the Solar Bylaw Draft dated October 9th, 2023. All right, do we hear any comments or a, a second? Jack? I guess we never really got down to that lower part of the page, but you know, water courses, lakes, ponds, wetlands, and slope greater than 25% may not be included. You know, I don't agree with that. So anyway, I just think this, this there is a lot here that again, I, I lean toward just leaving this to town council if they so choose. But so why don't you end with the word decommissioning? End with, yes, right there, above yeah. the yellow, end with that word decommissioning. Good idea. Because we haven't even discussed the other sections. Oh, okay. All right. Through oh. decommissioning? Let's be really clear about what we're voting on, and then if there's a second, and then we can just vote. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay, so the I, I think we revised the the motion to provide that um, the section ends um, with the words five years after decommissioning. Okay, hold on one second. And a yes vote means you want to include it and a no vote means you don't want to include it. Correct. Let me just finish writing this. <laughs> Revising. <laughs> um, Stephanie, I'm glad you're writing it because I'm certainly not as the minute taker here. Okay. okay, yeah, no worries. Yep. Um, I'm just revising how I was stating it myself. Um, okay, I think I've got it. To include the language currently in the draft section entitled Forest Clearing Limitations and Mitigation in the draft dated August 9th, 2023. October 9th. October 9th, I'm sorry. October 9th, 2023, through to the sentence ending in of five years after decommissioning. All right, do we have a uh, check? No, I'll... I'll... I assume that who moved it and I'll second it. <laughs> I don't know that we had someone actually move. I don't have that recorded. I think Dwayne should move it. Okay, okay. Uh, I didn't, okay, yes. I so move the emotion, the motion as articulated by Stephanie. And I second. Okay, I'm going to get you all on screen again for the vote. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. Okay, and if people could ensure you have your cameras on when I call your name. And again, a yes, so yes is I'm, yes yeah, is included. Work, yeah, Chris, no, it's done good. So okay. Yes, yes will be you agree with this language and want it included. A no vote is that you do not want the language included. Okay. So Brecker. Uh, no. Hanner. Yes. McGowan. Yes. Jemsek. You have to unmute, Jack. I'll come back to you. Brooks? Exclude, no. 
Pagliarulo, can you put your camera on, please? Mm -hmm. No. And Jemsek? No. OK. So the vote is to not include this section in the draft. All right. Thank you, everybody. That was a hard conversation. <clears throat> OK. Well, now, Dwayne, we, it's 12.17. You said our session yep. was going to end at one. We have a very big, important section that we've never discussed, and that's the battery storage. I doubt we're going to get it done in the next half hour. Um, let's just get a preview from uh, Stephanie. Do you still have, I'm not sure if I, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to get a quick you in want my me to draft. Put it back on? Um, yeah, I, just keep trying to get a sense of uh, how how many more pages we have here. Um, I think we have seven more pages. Seven. And you didn't finish this section. You you didn't discuss this little piece here. I think because you just excluded it from the I, vote. So it's actually eight pages because you're starting on page sixteen and going to page twenty five, or maybe that's nine pages because you haven't done farmland yet. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I'm not sure, um, Martha, why we would go out of order uh, because there is storage yeah. stuff later here. Yeah, I'm just reminding you that I don't think we're going to get through the whole thing today. Yeah, but... yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> we, can always, we can always request um, another meeting date if you don't, if you can't wrap this up today. Okay, I, I would um, I would suggest we just continue and get as far as we can, um, and then um, um, most assuming we don't get to the end, um, see about an ex, uh, another meeting. Mm -hmm. And I do want to, you know, we have till about ten of one um, to open for some public thoughts. Um, I don't believe you discussed this. Uh, to Jack's point, you were yes. not discussing this. And yet. this is somewhat orphaned now, right? <laughs> yes. Um, that part's not, it's not relevant anymore, is what yeah. Dave, uh, think, Dwayne just maybe said. Maybe we can just decide to okay. delete so, this. So, okay. If you do, if you decide to delete it, then that covers the last motion. So, yeah, um, Jack and then Janet. So, uh, we're discuss we're discussing the two lines there. Yes. Okay. So what I was saying before was that I just you know these, these things not to be included just don't make sense to me. Seeing how you know how important okay. they are, uh, especially wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, So, yeah, that's that's that. So you're fine with deleting it here? Correct. Yeah, okay. Janet, go ahead. Um, I was just hoping for a five minute break. Okay, um, I think that goes without saying. So um, <laughs> let's, let's um, I don't think we need a motion on that. I think we can just decide to do that. <laughs> so uh, it's 1220. Um, that's your time, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, uh, let's get back at 1225. If that Wait, works for Can me. I just real quick before you, um, yeah. adjourn, um, for a break, do you want to, do you want to come back to this or did you just decide that you're going to delete these last few sentences? I just want to make, be clear about that before you adjourn. Cause you were right. I think unless I hear anything otherwise, let's, um, let's delete these two. Uh, short sentences. Okay. Yeah, they're not really relevant now that we got rid of the earlier part. Okay. All right, great. So uh, we'll we'll zoom back up at uh, twelve twenty five.
All right, when people are ready, uh, please put your cameras back on so we know you're ready. <clears throat> Dwayne, I'm here. I'm just going to go off camera. Yeah, okay. yeah, I, yeah. I was going to give you a, an out on that one. <laughs> okay. So you look fine, Laura. Appreciate that. Laura, are you sick? I am. I have a, oh. had a fever for the past three days, and mm. my eight year old just woke up and she's oh. throwing up. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. Uh, oh. She has a fever, too. Who knows? It's just. Every summer I go into the fall thinking, no one's going to get sick this year. I'm going to get all these vitamins. I'm going to add it to the smoothies with the kale. And every year I'm thwarted in my plans. Too healthy, too healthy a diet. I know. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. Oh. Okay. Um, Jack, are you back by chance? Okay, let's assume Jack will get back real quickly. Um, and let's continue down the language. Um, and remind me where we are now, basically here. Okay. So this was really part of what we talked about before, but you didn't vote on it. Setbacks for LGPIs in forest land. We're all LGPIs located in forest land that are over five acres in, si in size. A 100-foot buffer of uncleared land shall be maintained between the LGPI and public roads and residential property lines. And I guess this was the, um, I think it was raised why, why if, if we should have a different, I, I, I think the dimensional number 100 was open for question. Right, and how that um, differed from our normal setback. So the normal setback is now, I believe, um, 50 feet. Yeah. And <clears throat> we're requiring that 30 feet of it be um, green screening. Screen. Yeah. But in the case where you have a large solar array next to a residential property line mm -hmm. or a public road, you're suggesting that it should be a bigger um, area. Yeah, yeah. We, we we discussed having 100 feet for those cases that you mentioned, so. So is that something you want to stick with? Yeah. Bob's shaking his head. Any comment on that, Bob, or just a no? <laughs> 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 no, I don't think we should be fussing around with buffers. You know, we have buffers to stick with what we have. We don't need exceptional buffers here and exceptional buffers there. I, yeah, don't, I, I don't remember the 50 feet, but if that's what it is, then, you know, that's fine. But I don't think we need another 50. Well, you, well, this was the standard, I thought. So Say that again, Martha. I thought this was the standard. I don't think we're changing anything. Well, we're changing it from 50 feet. Normally, we require 50 feet, except in the case where an LGPI is located in forest land. And in that case, if the array is five acres in size or greater, then you wanted to require a 100-foot buffer. Mm -hmm. But normally, you only require a 50-foot setback from property lines if, they're, if these things are not located in forest land. All right, go ahead, Janet. So, um, did I lower my hand? So I have a, a solar bylaw comparison chart. And so um, in terms of regular setbacks, um, you know, not in a solar array, in Belchertown, the front setback is 150 feet. In Hadley, it's 50. In Pelham, it's 500. And in Shootsbury, it's 500 feet. 
the side setbacks, Belcher Town is 75 feet, Hadley's 50, Pelham is 100, Shootsbury is 100. The rear is in Belcher Town, setback is 75 feet, 50 feet in Hadley, 100 feet in Pelham, and 100 feet in Shootsbury. And then there, there are different requirements for setbacks, uh, minimum setbacks for when you're a budding conservation or a residential district. In Belchertown, the front setback is 200 feet. In Hadley, it's 100 feet at Route 47, which I think is a scenic road. In Pelham, it's 500 feet. In Shootsbury, it's 500 feet. Um, and so it goes on like this, the side setbacks, um, side and rear setbacks for Belchertown are both 200 feet. In Hadley, it's 100 feet at, at Route 47. It's 100 feet in Pelham. It's 100 feet in Shootsbury. So those are sort of our our sister towns. I you know I I you know I just have to say this we this has been here for a long time. We had the mitigation requirement for three meeting three or four meetings and I, I don't know I don't know it seems fine to me. It seems like it protects um, forested land and kind of the look of it. Um, it protects the forest. It creates a better buffer. But I guess it might all be up for grabs. I don't know. Yep. Okay. Uh, Laura? Yeah, no, I just had a question. Um, so 50 feet is what we have for all other forms of development in Amherst, Chris? No, no. It's much, um, it's different in each district and it's, yeah. Um, so this would only apply to solar. Um, let me see if I can tell you what the distances are normally so i i think the only only comment i would add here is in an effort to move on to other sections is i don't feel you know especially if we're not including buffer land in the in the previous section that we just voted to remove um you know i think that we should always include language here that exceptions can be granted let's say there's I mean, I'm just giving the example of the Mass Pike, you know, not a beautiful road, you know, no no setbacks required because we're not protecting anything that's beautiful here. Be beauty is obviously entirely subjective, but I think we can all agree that um, we don't have an eyesore when we're going down the Mass Pike. So um, perhaps we can include some language that, you know, you know. Except other, as otherwise approved by the PGA. Yeah, something like that. I don't know how others feel, but I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. Martha. Yeah, if I recall correctly, some of our previous discussion was concern about, you know, when you take out the trees, you are changing uh, the water flow. And there was a real concern that against uh, residential properties, and particularly the ones where people are on private wells, but let's just say all residential properties, the concern really was, you know, potential for changing uh, erosion patterns onto the re adjacent property. And so we had kind of decided really that a 100 foot buffer of uncleared land was, was reasonable, certainly in residential zones. And as um, Janet just read, that's consistent or even less than our surrounding communities. And so if, if people want just something that's consistent throughout our bylaw, let's just say 100 for the whole bylaw. Otherwise, let's say uh, 100 feet of uncleared land for the forested area or for the forested area, yes, in against residential property lines. So I favor leaving yeah. the, the language as it is. Yeah, I, I mean, just for myself, I'm fine with the language as it is. I, I would, to um, Laura's point, maybe to add a caveat that, you know, subject to, um, uh, um, unless, unless, you know, approved by the PGA, uh, in the case where there's some situation where 100 feet just doesn't make sense. So then the PGA could make it be 200 feet if somebody if a if a adjacent um, landowner was interesting right that's they can always they can do that anyway yes yeah okay mm -hmm. all right um let's move on to the farm 
land provisions unless um uh, janet one last thought you know in the in i'm looking ahead to the setbacks um for um scenic roads and it's a hundred foot um setback that we approved and i actually think that all the forested roads are scenic roads we have like quite a few scenic roads in in Amherst. So I'm just, um, I can't say that authoritatively, but I was, I, there's a chart, there's a list of those roads and I would think Shootsbury Road and uh, Flat Hills Road and think places like that are, when I think of the forested sites, clearly the Holyoke Range would be and Bay Road would be in there. All right, good. So it's consistent with that. Okay, uh, let's go on to the special provisions or, or requirements for um, farmland. Okay, am I muted or not? No. Yep. Okay, agrivoltaix required for land that is categorized. I'm sorry, as... uh, sorry, Chris. Uh, uh, let me just check. Has a comment. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I had to check out for a minute, um, so I missed what what happened with the setbacks. <laughs> we decided really... to leave leave it the way it is stated here, except to add the phrase "except as otherwise approved by the PGA." Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For land that is categorized as prime farmland or farm farmland of statewide importance in accordance with USDA criteria and is being actively farmed or has been actively farmed in the last five years, any LGPI that is over five acres in size shall be developed and operated as an agrivoltaics array, meeting the definition of ASTGU agricultural solar tariff generation units of the Massachusetts SMART program or successor programs, unless the landowner or LGPI developer or applicant can demonstrate to the PGA that it has analyzed the financial and technical feasibility of agrivoltaics and has found that an agrivoltaic installation is not financially or technically feasible on the property. In order to make such a demonstration, the landowner, LGPI developer or applicant shall engage the services of a professional in agrivoltaics, such as a soil scientist, an agronomist, or other credentialed professional to demonstrate that an agrivoltaics installation is not financially or technically feasible on the property in question. For all land that is prime farmland or farmland of statewide importance, regardless of current use or size of the array, Soil shall be managed or conserved so that the land remains suitable for future farming activities. The PGA shall look positively favorably on solar installations that include agro agrivoltaics or dual use. So what are the comments about that? All right. Um, yeah, Martha? Uh, yes, well, I was... Uh one of those who went out to in, inspect uh, Jake's uh, installation there in, in North Hadley with the broccoli growing. And it seemed, uh, you know, of great to me. It seemed like it was a, a very good arrangement. And I really feel that every farmer knows their land well. They know where the crops grow best. They know the land that they would like to then put into agrivoltaics or whatever. And um, so I think that this present wording sounds very reasonable because I think if there is a case where they want to put uh, solar panels on some land that's not very productive, all they have to do is show that, hey, you know, that's not where I'm growing crops, food crops at the moment. It's the non-productive area. I can put hay underneath and, you know, this will be great. Otherwise, I think it works very well for the food crops. Hey, that broccoli that was growing in the shade of the of the solar panels really looked healthy when we went to see it. I was I was quite impressed with the uh with the array up there. So so I favor the current language. All right, thanks. Uh Bob. Yeah, I've um you already crossed out what I suggested this be. I'm opposed to requiring this. I do I am very much in favor of the idea. I just don't like the idea of requiring it. Uh, Laura? I agree with um, Bob's sentiment. I think we should encourage it, but I also know that 
um, that any time um, you go for an agrivoltaic certification in Massachusetts, we can either like what I I don't know if the bylaw working group has the option for this, but I you know so if you go for state certification, there are additional requirements that some farmers and asset owners may or may not want to undertake um, because it requires clawbacks of incentives. And I'm not as familiar with the particulars as Dwayne probably is. So I think if we are ever going to require this above and beyond what the state is requiring, I think we should offer financial incentives. And that's a discussion for town council. Otherwise, I suggest putting um, Bob's language back in there because I think it'd be great to see more agrivoltaic systems. Um, I don't think um, Marley's farm is the example that could be applied across the board. Um, but again, I support in encouraging it, not requiring it. All right. Um, yeah, just in terms of the commitment of the STGU um, adder, which is significant. Uh, and what the requirement is, is basically that the land, the landowner farmer uh, and solar owner work together to assure that farming is maintained, sustained throughout the lifetime of the array, or, or I should say of the SMART incentive, which is 20 years, I believe. Um, and so that's, that's the commitment of the landowner uh, is to maintain and sustain good productive agriculture uh, for 20 years. And just ask a question there, Dwayne. If the farmer was, let's say, he's 60 and he wants to do this in the beginning, but then, you know, at the end of the day, he's going to sell or his son or daughter is going to inherit the land and they decide they do not want to consider farming, the, the underlying sort of financial modeling of the project changes, right? Well, then, yeah, yeah. Well, if they don't, if they don't have a succession plan to continue farming, yes, the, the incentive could be clawed back, uh, which, you know, leaves the project in, in a difficult situation, obviously, uh, how that risk is split between the landowner and the solar owner is up to their bilateral agreement, I would imagine. All right, um, Janet, and then Bob, if you still have your hand up. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting, one of the interesting things about um, visiting the farm was sort of understanding the the dual use farm, which is quite small actually, is it was quite lucrative for the farmer, and so um, just by leasing his land, he was getting like ten thousand dollars an acre. Um, he got power at seventeen percent less um, for electricity for ten years, and then I don't this probably doesn't happen to everybody. He also got some water wells on what was a dry, very dry piece of land. And then also power outlets because they had to be put in for um, um, the array. And so the adder the state is giving is really lucrative. And if you just, if he had, if they had just done um, a regular array, he could have leased it for like a thousand to 2000 an acre for a traditional ground mount. And admittedly the, um, the dual use thing was more expensive and space farther apart because it had to be space so tractors could go in and it was the the mounting was higher and they also had a um a tracker system which no one has to do and so the economics are really there and apparently like a lot of local farmers and people from around the state and even Connecticut are coming to look at it so you know you could sort of frame this as a like an undue burden but it actually seems like you're going to make more money with it than without it. Um, which which was interesting and and kind of good to know. Um, I think the question here is the purpose of this whole section is how to keep farmland in use. How do you keep the natural working lands working? And um, as Dan Kaplan, former farmer of Brookfield Farm for over twenty years, said, "We're not making more farmland, you know." And so this is a way of keeping land in farming as farms producing you know vegetables and hay or whatever and also um, getting green power. And so, I don't know, it just seems to me, you know, it's not a, it's not a complete requirement. There are ways out of it. And so I, I just really support it. And I think Amherst can be a leader in the state in terms of, you know, promoting agrivoltaics, the importance of farmland um, and just moving the needle to where we need to go. And, 
you know, fortunately the needle is moving because people are getting more informed by these live experiments, but I strongly support this. All right, good. Okay, uh, Laura, do you have another comment? Yeah, just quickly. So um, the market for an acre of land to lease in Massachusetts without agrivoltaics right now is about $2,500 to $3,000 an acre. I don't know the size of Marley's um, array. I suspect it's fairly small, um, but those economics of $10,000 an acre um, would not necessarily translate to the broad base of solar developers um, who are out there. And some developers and asset owners are equipped to support this. And listen, Jen, I, I love the idea of having more agrivoltaic farms. I mean, I think we are a farming community we have special soils in the valley. Um, I just, you know, I don't want to sort of cut off our nose to spite our faces here. Um, so strongly encourage means that we'll look more favorably, of course, on projects that haven't, you know, perhaps incorporated some of the land for dual use. But I just think if we have a good solar project and and um, maybe someone stopped farming it four years ago for reasons that are personal to them. Um, I don't think it's our business to make them do it again if there's not the financial incentive. That's all. All right. I mean, I do. I do recognize there is the language in there. While it's the language of strongly encourage is, is struck out, there is an out uh, from the landowner and the farmer um, if they can demonstrate that there's not sufficient financial incentive uh, to make the project work. Um, and so that's that's was sort of the we're putting um, the burden again on the landowner, right, and the developer. Exactly to to um, to to demonstrate that it that uh, to demonstrate that agrivel takes would not be financially feasible. Um, but if it is, so if they do have an out, you know, maybe part of that argument is uh, they don't have a succession plan, so uh, financially. They can't make this work. They can't take this risk, but that would be up to the PGA to assess. Um, uh, but it 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 would it would, and obviously they don't need to go solar at all. They could sell it off for uh, whatever other reason. Um, uh, but it would keep them from putting in a ground mounted array, um, and losing the farmability of that land. Um, okay. Um, let's try to. Uh, um, I mean, I'm. I'm personally, I'm happy with this language. Um, incur not in, well requiring it unless they can demonstrate there's a financial reason that they or technical reason that they can't do it. Um, uh, but um, I do see some objection to it. Uh, but generally, um, any other any other comments or, or yays or nays for, for leaving this in? Chris? I just want to point out that we have 11 minutes left in yeah. this meeting, and I have two other meetings this afternoon, so I'm not going to be able to stay, yeah, you know, okay. much after one. So I just wanted to, you know, point that out. Yeah. I have to go, too. Okay. Uh, likewise. So could we just get a consensus one way or the other on this and then on this one? stop? Yeah. Yep. Um, I, let's let's move forward with this language in there, unless I hear any um, any sort of majority opinion otherwise. I've heard some some nays, but not not a majority. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, well, let's um, in, in in respect for the uh, public comment and the need to stop at one. Let's put a bookmark right here, Chris, if we may, and and, and Stephanie, uh, with the full recognition that we need, we have a lot more to go. Uh, and apologies for that. Um, and let's, before we go to the public, which will close out things, are, um, Stephanie, can you just remind us of the process that we might be in front of us with regard to another meeting. Uh, sure. So we'll just need to request um, another extension of the town manager for an additional meeting. Um, you might want to 
I, I don't know if you want to try to come up with a date now or not. I could just do a poll, um, another doodle poll. Um, but you or you could go back to your um, Friday schedule, eleven thirty to one thirty, which is what you had been doing, which seems most people had been available. Um, if you don't get the majority of folks, then we can try other dates. I am totally unavailable on Friday, but I'm free almost all of next week. Uh, this week, I'm totally unavailable Friday. Uh, I could, if we wanted to wait till the following Friday, we could schedule that time, that our normal time then. Okay, and so I would also, also um, propose that we make it a three-hour meeting if we can, um, because um, we took the full three hours here. So that would be Friday, October 20th. You could do it from... Um, 10 30 to 1 30 or 10 to 1 i'm good anytime myself any um anybody have any restrictions on friday the um the 20th yeah this is bob i have company i can't you know just set her aside so sorry did laura day. say did laura say that she's not available any friday no, I'm I'm available the twentieth, but perhaps we look toward another date next week if Bob Why can make it. I think I should do a doodle poll because I think okay. we're gonna you're gonna eat up all your time here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's do that. I mean, we can include some earlier dates too. This this whole week, it, uh, I'm I'm really out. Uh, but maybe next uh, a few times next week um, would work. Would, would uh, for the doodle poll. Thank you, Stephanie, for sure. that additional work no worries um, okay good let's um open it up for any public input if anyone would like to um speak please electronically raise your hand and i will unmute you scott cashin you can go ahead and unmute thank you stephanie um i had a comment about the mitigation for loss of forest land. I know that the committee voted on that, so I don't uh, necessarily need to rehash that issue. I don't know if you know we're sort of moving on at this point or not. You could certainly comment on it, but we are moving on. Okay. Well, I'll, I, there's a couple things I wanted to point out. Um, I, I certainly understand the right you know, the argument that pub, that private landowners should have the right to do what they want on their land. Um, but I, I think it's important to recognize that a lot of the resources that would be affected by clearing forest for solar development are public resources. So we're talking about things like wildlife habitat, water quality, flood attenuation, you know, other things that are public resources. So what the bylaw is now allowing is for private individuals and corporations to profit at the expense at the expense of public resources. Um, even with mitigation, you know the mitigation that was proposed in the bylaw, there would be net loss of forest land, and that's because the mitigation involved preservation, not restoration. So even with the mitigation, there was going to be net loss. And now with no mitigation, you're going to have, you know, double the net loss. Um, you know, it's really interesting to me because I got involved um, in California right at the very beginning uh, of, you know, the, the renewable, the massive amount of renewable energy development that occurred there in the last 15 years. And so I've seen how things played out. Um, and a lot of the projects that were built were required to provide mitigation. And even with that mitigation, there are now several plant and animal species whose primary threat to continued persistence is additional solar energy development. So, you know, limitations on solar energy development in areas that have been designated, you know, priority habitat or, you know, circled on the biomap, that's not going to prevent, you know, Massachusetts from heading down that same path. So it's really sort of disheartening to me um, to see that, you know, the town is sort of not learning from experience of what's happened elsewhere. 
um, in, in deciding whether mitigation should be required or not. Um, and finally, um, you know, I, I understand the optics of, um, you know, requiring solar energy development to have to provide mitigation, but other types of development not. Um, you know, I look at that as an opportunity to sort of rectify maybe mistakes in other bylaws or zoning, you know, ordinances, just because it was maybe appropriate at the time that particular bylaw was developed doesn't mean it's appropriate now. And so why would we sort of repeat a mistake that was made or why are we not adapting to, you know, where we're at currently with respect to, you know, the, the desire to preserve forest land and biodiversity. So those are my comments. Thank you. Hey, Lenore Rick, Rick, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, my insides are are feeling you. This is so hard. So I want to echo um, what Scott was talking about. A couple of points that I, I had the same kind of response to is one, to be very careful that past experiences, past bylaws, past approaches to development, um, what other towns have done, what we've done, not be the reference point and the model. I know, of course, it informs everything we do, but um, we are in a very different era. And, and what we're asking you to do is to be very brave, bold, echo climate pioneers, which I know is not easy, especially um, you know, you're, you're thinking about uh, the lawsuit next do door and things like that. But this is, this is just the way it is now. We have to fight for what we, for what we need. And I, I just want to point out, again, building on what Scott was saying, that we have to remember that the purpose of solar development is to address the climate crisis. It is one tool in our toolbox. This is not about um, protecting the rights of any one particular sector, whether it's the landowner or the solar developer or anybody. This is, this is the team that we're building to protect um, and preserve and regenerate the world that we basically are destroying. And so it's a very different kind of approach that we need when we're thinking about even developing one simple bylaw in one town. And, and it's not just one simple bylaw in one town because people will be looking to Amherst as a model of it, just the way we look to other towns, they will be looking to our town. To, like, what did we do? How brave were we? How innovative were we? How, um, how informed were we? How holistic were we in our approach to this. So I, I'm just urging us, I know you've made these decisions already, but just in moving forward or maybe even reviewing that um, we, are, we are entering a different chapter of our human evolution and we need different criteria to, um, uh, to move forward in a way that we've never, ever, ever done before, which means it has to be much more holistic. And I appreciate what you've been talking about that um, this lens should be a lens for all development, not just solar development. I'm, I'm not talking about burdening solar developers. I'm just talking about this is like team humanity, not one particular um, uh, lens to look through, but the entire holistic lens, which is quite a pickle that you find yourself in is just this small committee. But as much as you can do that, we would all be very grateful in the future for that kind of foresight. Thank you. Hey, Steve Roof, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Steve Roof from South Amherst. Um, thank you all for your effort and uh, putting tons and tons of time into this. I wanted to mention one thing that didn't get mentioned again with the um, forest mitigation issue. And that's that of all the forest loss, solar is responsible for less than 25% and maybe closer to 10 or 
The Mass Audubon states that solar development has only been responsible for a quarter of forest loss. And um, John Rogan presenting at the Solar Forum a couple of weeks ago said it was um, solar development was 10 to 15. So you know, 80 to 90% of forest loss is from other kinds of development. Uh, I think it's really important to keep that in mind. So if you, if you um, slow down slow solar development or burden solar development, as, as Laura mentioned, those housing developments are, are going to be favored. So moving forward, you, what you, your committee, your working group might consider would be to suggest to town council that they come up with a plan that requires forest mitigation for all developments. Um, consider that as an option. And I think that would be very reasonable and it would level, level the playing field. So that may be something you want to include in your letter accompanying the draft solar bylaw. Uh, again, that's all I have to say for now. Thanks for all of your work and um, see you next time, I guess. <laughs>
continue reviewing the basic solar bylaw and review the battery storage bylaw, maybe that's all we need to do. And then I will incorporate those other comments some other time. I just, you know, I have a limited amount of time and I have other things going on. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thanks. I quickly ask if people have uh, conflicts two weeks from today at the same time. If Tuesday the 24th would work. I'm just throwing that out as a last ditch. I'm free. Um, no, no. Um, are we talking about 10 o'clock Eastern Tuesday, time? Tuesday, October 24th, 10 o'clock. I I teach a class. I, it, today was different because it's a Monday schedule at UMass. But okay, all right. Well, just I'll do the poll. I just was one last shot. Okay, so I'll do the poll. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, sir. Or we could have two meetings. We could have just continuing from this draft next Friday, and then another one to you know do the final things. You know, two shorter ones. We had My folks have a conflict, so. Okay. Yeah, I think it's best to get all the, you know, the most recent yeah. thing. I mean, we I mean, need to end this, folks. Yeah, so, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll send out a doodle poll. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. And thank you, everybody, for a productive meeting. Okay. Very good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.